The Divine Comedy, The Vision of Hell, Purgatory, and Paradise, by Dante Alighieri, Hell, or the Inferno. Canto One. In the midway of this our mortal life I found me in a gloomy wood, astray gone from the path direct. And e'en to tell it were no easy task, how savage wild that forest, how robust and rough its growth, which to remember only my dismay renews, in bitterness not far from death. Yet to discourse of what their good befell, all else will I relate discovered there. How first I entered it I scarce can say. Such sleepy dullness in that instant weighed my senses down, when the true path I left. But when a mountain's foot I reached, where closed the valley, that had pierced my heart with dread, I looked aloft, and saw his shoulders broad, already vested with that planet's beam, who leads all wanderers safe through every way. Then was a little respite to the fear, that in my heart's recesses deep had lain, all of that night so pitifully passed, and as a man with difficult short breath, forspent with toiling, scaped from sea to shore, turns to the perilous wide waste and stands at gaze. E'en so my spirit, that yet failed struggling with terror, turned to view the straits, that none hath passed and lived. My weary frame, after short pause recomforted, Again I journeyed on over that lonely steep, the hinder foot still firmer. Scarce the ascent began, when lo, a panther, nimble, light, and covered with a speckled skin appeared, nor when it saw me vanished, rather strove to check my onward going, that oft times with purpose to retrace my steps I turned. The hour was morning's prime, and on his way aloft the sun ascended with those stars, that with him rose when love divine first moved those its fair works, so that with joyous hope all things conspired to fill me, the gay skin of that swift animal, the matin dawn and the sweet season. Soon that joy was chased and by new dread succeeded, when in view a lion came, gainst me as it appeared, with his head held aloft and hunger mad, that e'en the air was fear-struck. A she-wolf was at his heels, who in her leanness seemed full of all wants, and many a land hath made disconsolate ere now. She with such fear o'erwhelmed me at the sight of her appalled, that of the height all hope I lost. As one who with his gain elated sees the time when all unwares is gone, he inwardly mourns with heart-griping anguish. Such was I, haunted by that fell beast, never at peace, who coming o'er against me by degrees impelled me where the sun in silence rests. While to the lower space with backward step I fell, my ken discerned the form one of one, whose voice seemed faint through long disuse of speech. When him in that great desert I espied, have mercy on me, cried I out aloud, spirit, or living man, whate'er thou be. He answered, now not man, man once I was, and born of Lombard parents, Mantuana both by country, when the power of Julius yet was scarcely firm. At Rome my life was passed beneath the mild Augustus, in the time of fabled deities and false. A bard was I, and made Anchises' upright son the subject of my song, who came from Troy, when the flames preyed on Ilium's haughty towers. But thou, say wherefore to such perils past returnst thou, wherefore not this pleasant mount ascendest, cause and source of all delight. And art thou then that Virgil that well spring, from which such copious floods of eloquence have issued? I with front abashed replied, Glory and light of all the tuneful train, may it avail me that I long with zeal have sought thy volume and with love immense have conned it o'er. My master thou and guide, thou he from whom alone I have derived that style which for its beauty into fame exalts me. See the beast from whom I fled, O oh, save me from her, thou illustrious sage, for every vein and pulse throughout my frame she hath made tremble. He soon as he saw that I was weeping answered, Thou must needs another way pursue if thou wouldst scape from out that savage wilderness. This beast, at whom thou criest, her way will suffer none to pass, and no less hindrance makes than death. So bad and so accursed in her kind, that never sated is her ravenous will, still after food more craving than before. To many an animal in wedlock vile she fastens, and shall yet to many more, until that greyhound come, who shall destroy her with sharp pain. He will not life support by earth nor its base metals, but by love, wisdom, and virtue, and his land shall be the land twixt either feltro. In his might shall safety to Italia's plains arise, 
for whose fair realm Camilla, virgin pure, Nisus, Euryalus, and Turnus fell, he with incessant chase through every town shall worry, until he to hell at length restore her, thence by envy first let loose. I for thy profit pondering now devise, that thou mayest follow me, and I thy guide will lead thee hence through an eternal space, where thou shalt hear despairing shrieks, and see spirits of old tormented, who invoke a second death. And those next view, who dwell content in fire, for that they hope to come, whene'er the time may be among the blest, into whose regions if thou then desire to ascend, a spirit worthier than I must lead thee, in whose charge when I depart, thou shalt be left. For that almighty king who reigns above, a rebel to his law, adjudges me, and therefore hath decreed, that to his city none through me should come. He in all parts hath sway, there rules, there holds his citadel and throne. O oh, happy those whom there he chooses! I to him in few. Bard, by that God whom thou didst not adore, I do beseech thee, that this ill and worse I may escape, to lead me where thou saidst, that I St. Peter's gate may view, and those who as thou tellest are in such dismal plight. Onward he moved, I close his steps pursued. Canto two. Now was the day departing, and the air, embrowned with shadows, from their toils released all animals on earth, and I alone prepared myself the conflict to sustain, both of sad pity and that perilous road, which my unerring memory shall retrace. O muses, O high genius, now vouchsafe your aid, O mind, that all I saw has kept safe in a written record, here thy worth and eminent endowments come to proof. I thus began. Bard, thou who art my guide, consider well, if virtue be in me sufficient, ere to this high enterprise thou trust me. Thou hast told that Silvius's sire, yet clothed in corruptible flesh, among the immortal tribes had entrance, and was their sensible present. Yet if heaven's great lord, almighty foe to ill, such favor showed, in contemplation of the high effect, both what and who from him should issue forth, it seems in reason's judgment well deserved. Sith he of Rome, and of Rome's empire wide, in heaven's imperial height was chosen, sire, both which, if truth be spoken, were ordained and established for the holy place, where sits who to great Peter's sacred chair succeeds. He from this journey, in thy song renowned, learned things, that to his victory gave rise and to the papal robe. In after times the chosen vessel also traveled there, to bring us back assurance in that faith, which is the entrance to salvation's way. But I, why should I there presume, or who permits it? Not Aeneas I nor Paul. Myself I deem not worthy, and none else will deem me. I, if on this voyage then I venture, fear it will in folly end. Thou who art wise, better my meaning knowest than I can speak. As one who unresolves what he hath late resolved, and with new thoughts changes his purpose, from his first intent removed, e'en such was I on that dun coast, wasting in thought my enterprise, at first so eagerly embraced. If right thy words I scan, replied that shade magnanimous, thy soul is by vile fear assailed, which oft so overcasts a man, that he recoils from noblest resolution, like a beast at some false semblance in the twilight gloom. That from this terror thou mayest free thyself, I will instruct thee why I came, and what I heard in that same instant, when for thee grief touched me first. I was among the tribe who rest suspended, when a dame so blessed and lovely I besought her to command, called me. Her eyes were brighter than the star of day, and she with gentle voice and soft angelically tuned her speech addressed, O courteous shade of Mantua, thou whose fame yet lives, and shall live long as nature lasts, a friend, not of my fortune but myself, on the wide desert in his road has met hindrance so great, that he through fear has turned. Now much I dread lest he past help have strayed, and I be risen too late for his relief, from what in heaven of him I heard. Speed now, and by thy eloquent persuasive tongue, and by all means for his deliverance meet, assist him. So to me will comfort spring. I who now bid thee on this errand forth am Beatrice, from a place I come. Note, Beatrice. I use this word, as it is pronounced in the Italian, as consisting of four syllables, of which the third is a long one. Revisited with joy. Love brought me thence who prompts my speech. When in my master's sight I stand, 
thy praise to him I oft will tell. She then was silent, and I thus began. O lady, by whose influence alone mankind excels whatever is contained within that heaven which hath the smallest orb, so thy command delights me, that to obey, if it were done already, would seem late. No need hast thou farther to speak thy will, yet tell the reason why thou art not loath to leave that ample space, where to return thou burnest, for this centre here beneath. She then, since thou so deeply wouldst inquire, I will instruct thee briefly why no dread hinders my entrance here. Those things alone are to be feared, whence evil may proceed, none else, for none are terrible beside. I am so framed by God, thanks to his grace, that any sufferance of your misery touches me not, nor flame of that fierce fire assails me. In high heaven a blessed dame besides, who mourns with such effectual grief that hindrance, which I send thee to remove, that God's stern judgment to her will inclines. To Lucia calling her she thus bespake, Now doth thy faithful servant need thy aid, and I commend him to thee. At her word sped Lucia of all cruelty the foe, and coming to the place where I abode seated with Rachel, her of ancient days, she thus addressed me, Thou true praise of God. Beatrice, why is not thy succor lent to him, who so much loved thee, as to leave for thy sake all the multitude admires? Dost thou not hear how pitiful his wail? nor mark the death, which in the torrent flood, swoln mightier than a sea, him struggling holds. Ne'er among men did any with such speed haste to their profit, flee from their annoy, as when these words were spoken I came here, down from my blessed seat, trusting the force of thy pure eloquence, which thee, and all who well have marked it, into honour brings. When she had ended, her bright beaming eyes tearful she turned aside, whereat I felt redoubled zeal to serve thee. As she willed, thus am I come, I saved thee from the beast, who thy near way across the goodly mount prevented. What is this comes o'er thee then? Why, why dost thou hang back? Why in thy breast harbour vile fear? Why hast not courage there and noble daring? Since three maids so blessed thy safety plan, e'en in the court of heaven, and so much certain good my words forebode. As florets by the frosty air of night bent down and closed, when day has blanched their leaves, rise all unfolded on their spiry stems. So was my fainting vigor new restored, and to my heart such kindly courage ran, that I as one undaunted soon replied, O oh, full of pity she who undertook my succor, and thou kind who didst perform so soon her true behest. With such desire thou hast disposed me to renew my voyage, that my first purpose fully is resumed. Lead on, one only will is in us both. Thou art my guide, my master thou and lord. So spake I, and when he had onward moved, I entered on the deep and woody way. Canto 3 Through me you pass into the city of woe. Through me you pass into eternal pain. Through me among the people lost for I. Justice the founder of my fabric moved. To rear me was the task of power divine, supremest wisdom, and primeval love. Before me things create were none, save things eternal, and eternal I endure. All hope abandon ye who enter here. Such characters in color dim I marked over a portal's lofty arch inscribed, whereat I thus, Master, these words import hard meaning. He as one prepared replied, Here thou must all distrust behind thee leave, here be vile fear extinguished. We are come where I have told thee we shall see the souls to misery doomed, who intellectual good have lost. And when his hand he had stretched forth to mine with pleasant looks whence I was cheered, into that secret place he led me on. Here sighs with lamentations and loud moans resounded through the air pierced by no star, that e and I wept at entering. Various tongues, horrible languages, outcries of woe, accents of anger, voices deep and hoarse, with hands together smote that swelled the sounds, made up a tumult, that forever whirls round through that air with solid darkness stained, like to the sand that in the whirlwind flies. I then with error yet encompassed cried, O oh, master, what is this I hear? What race are these who seem so overcome with woe? He thus to me, This miserable fate suffer the wretched souls of those who lived without or praise or blame, with that ill band of angels mixed, who nor rebellious proved, nor yet were true to God, but for themselves were only. 
From his bounds heaven drove them forth, not to impair his luster, nor the depth of hell receives them, lest the accursed tribe should glory thence with exultation vain. I then, Master, what doth aggrieve them thus, that they lament so loud? He straight replied, That will I tell thee briefly. These of death no hope may entertain, and their blind life so meanly passes that all other lots they envy. Fame of them the world hath none, nor suffers. Mercy and justice scorn them both. Speak not of them, but look and pass them by. And I, who straightway looked, beheld a flag, which whirling ran around so rapidly that it no pause obtained. And following came such a long train of spirits, I should ne'er have thought that death so many had despoiled. When some of these I recognized, I saw and knew the shade of him, who to base fear yielding abjured his high estate. Forthwith I understood for certain this the tribe of those ill spirits both to God displeasing and to his foes. These wretches who ne'er lived went on in nakedness, and sorely stung by wasps and hornets, which bedewed their cheeks with blood, that mixed with tears dropped to their feet, and by disgustful worms was gathered there. Then looking farther onwards, I beheld a throng upon the shore of a great stream, whereat I thus, Sir, grant me now to know whom here we view, and whence impelled they seem so eager to pass o'er, as I discern through the blear light. He thus to me and few, This shalt thou know, soon as our steps arrive beside the woeful tide of Acheron. Then with eyes downward cast and filled with shame, fearing my words offensive to his ear, till we had reached the river, I from speech abstained. And lo, toward us in a bark comes on an old man hoary white with eld, crying, Woe to you wicked spirits! Hope not ever to see the sky again. I come to take you to the other shore across, into eternal darkness, there to dwell in fierce heat and in ice. And thou who there standest live spirit, get thee hence and leave these who are dead. But soon as he beheld I left them not. By other way, said he, by other haven shalt thou come to shore, not by this passage, thee a nimbler boat must carry. Then to him thus spake my guide, Charon thyself torment not, so it is willed, where will and power are one, ask thou no more. Straightway in silence fell the shaggy cheeks of him, the boatman o'er the livid lake, around whose eyes glared wheeling flames. Meanwhile those spirits, faint and naked, color changed, and gnashed their teeth, soon as the cruel words they heard. God and their parents they blasphemed, the humankind, the place, the time, and seed that did engender them and give them birth. Then altogether sorely wailing drew to the cursed strand, that every man must pass who fears not God. Charon, demoniac form, with eyes of burning coal, collects them all, beckoning and each that lingers with his oar strikes. As fall off the light autumnal leaves, one still another following, till the bough strews all its honors on the earth beneath. E'en in like manner Adam's evil brood cast themselves one by one down from the shore, each at a beck, as falcon at his call. Thus go they over through the umbered wave, and ever they on the opposing bank be landed, on this side another throng still gathers. Son, thus spake the courteous guide, those who die subject to the wrath of God, all here together come from every clime, and to o'erpass the river are not loath. For so heaven's justice goads them on, that fear is turned into desire. Hence ne'er hath passed good spirit. If of thee Charon complain, now mayest thou know the import of his words. This said, the gloomy region trembling shook so terribly, that yet with clammy dews fear chills my brow. The sad earth gave a blast, that lightning shot forth a vermilion flame, which all my senses conquered quite, and I down dropped, as one with sudden slumber seized. Canto 4 broke the deep slumber in my brain a crash of heavy thunder that I shook myself, as one by main force roused. Risen upright, my rested eyes I moved around and searched with fixed ken to know what place it was, wherein I stood. For certain on the brink I found me of the lamentable veil, the dread abyss, that joins a thunderous sound of plaints innumerable, dark and deep, and thick with clouds o'erspread, mine eye in vain explored its bottom, nor could aught discern. Now let us to the blind world there beneath descend. The bard began all pale of look. I go the first, and thou shalt follow next. Then I his altered hue perceiving thus, How may I speed if thou yieldest to dread, 
who still art wont to comfort me in doubt. He then, the anguish of that race below with pity stains my cheek, which thou for fear mistakest. Let us on, our length of way urges to haste. Onward this said he moved, and entering led me with him on the bounds of the first circle that surrounds the abyss. Here, as mine ear could note, no plaint was heard except of sighs that made the eternal air tremble, not caused by tortures, but from grief felt by those multitudes, many and vast, of men, women, and infants. Then to me the gentle guide, Inquirest thou not what spirits are these which thou beholdest? Ere thou pass farther I would thou know that these of sin were blameless, and if aught they merited it profits not, since baptism was not theirs, the portal to thy faith. If they before the gospel lived, they served not God aright, and among such am I. For these defects, and for no other evil we are lost, only so far afflicted that we live desiring without hope. So grief assailed my heart at hearing this, for well I knew suspended in that limbo many a soul of mighty worth. O oh, tell me, sire revered, tell me, my master. I began through wish of full assurance in that holy faith, which vanquishes all error. Say did e'er any, or through his own or other's merit, come forth from thence, whom afterward was blessed. Piercing the secret purport of my speech, he answered, I was new to that estate, when I beheld a puissant one arrive amongst us with victorious trophy crowned. He forth the shade of our first parent drew, Abel his child, and Noah righteous man, of Moses lawgiver for faith approved, of patriarch Abraham, and David king, Israel with his sire and with his sons, nor without Rachel whom so hard he won, and others many more, whom he to bliss exalted. Before these be thou assured, no spirit of humankind was ever saved. We, while he spake, ceased not our onward road still passing through the wood, for so I name those spirits thick beset. We were not far on this side from the summit, when I kenned a flame that o'er the darkened hemisphere prevailing shined. Yet we a little space were distant, not so far but I in part discovered that a tribe in honor high that place possessed. O thou who every art and science valuest, who are these that boast such honor separate from all the rest? He answered, the renown of their great names that echoes through your world above, acquires favor in heaven, which holds them thus advanced. Meantime a voice I heard, Honor the bard sublime, his shade returns that left us late. No sooner ceased the sound than I beheld four mighty spirits toward us bend their steps, of semblance neither sorrowful nor glad. When thus my master kind began, Mark him, who in his right hand bears that falchion keen, the other three proceeding as their lord. This is that Homer of all bards supreme, Flaccus the next in satire's vein excelling, the third is Naso, Lucan is the last, because they all that appellation own, with which the voice singly accosted me, honoring they greet me thus, and well they judge. So I beheld united the bright school of him, the monarch of sublimest song, that o'er the others like an eagle soars. When they together short discourse had held, they turned to me with salutation kind beckoning me, at the which my master smiled, nor was this all, but greater honor still they gave me, for they made me of their tribe, and I was sixth amid so learned a band, far as the luminous beacon on we passed, speaking of matters, then befitting well to speak, now fitter left untold. At foot of a magnificent castle we arrived, seven times with lofty walls begirt, and round defended by a pleasant stream. O'er this as o'er dry land we passed. Next through seven gates I with those sages entered, and we came into a mead with lively verdure fresh. There dwelt a race who slow their eyes around majestically moved, and in their port bore eminent authority. They spake seldom, but all their words were tuneful sweet. We to one side retired, into a place open and bright and lofty, whence each one stood manifest to view. Incontinent, there on the green enamel of the plain were shown me the great spirits, by whose sight I am exalted in my own esteem. Electra there I saw accompanied by many, among whom Hector I knew, Anchises' pious son, and with hawk's eye Caesar all armed, and by Camilla there Penthesilea. On the other side old King Latinus seated by his child Lavinia, and that Brutus I beheld, who Tarquin chased, Lucretia, Cato's wife Marcia, with Julia and Cornelia there, 
and soul apart retired the Soldan fierce. Then, when a little more I raised my brow, I spied the master of the sapient throng, seated amid the philosophic train. Him all admire, all pay him reverence due. There Socrates and Plato both I marked, nearest to him in rank. Democritus, who sets the world at chance, Diogenes with Heraclitus and Empedocles, and Anaxagoras and Thales' sage, Zeno and Dioscorides, well read in nature's secret lore. Orpheus I marked and Linus, Tully and Moral Seneca, Euclid and Ptolemy, Hippocrates, Galenus Avicen, and him who made that commentary vast of Eroes. Of all to speak at full were vain attempt, for my wide theme so urges that oft times my words fall short of what bechanced. In two, the six associates part. Another way my sage guide leads me from that air serene into a climate ever vexed with storms, and to a part I come where no light shines. Canto five. From the first circle I descended thus down to the second, which a lesser space embracing so much more of grief contains provoking bitter moans. There Minos stands grinning with ghastly feature. He, of all who enter, strict examining the crimes, gives sentence, and dismisses them beneath, according as he foldeth him around. For when before him comes the ill-fated soul, it all confesses, and that judge severe of sins, considering what place in hell suits the transgression, with his tail so oft himself in circles, as degrees beneath he dooms it to descend. Before him stand always a numerous throng, and in his turn each one to judgment passing speaks and hears his fate, thence downward to his dwelling hurled. O thou, who to this residence of woe approachest? When he saw me coming, cried Minos, relinquishing his dread employ, look how thou enter here, beware in whom thou place thy trust. Let not the entrance broad deceive thee to thy harm. To him, my guide, wherefore exclaimest, hinder not his way by destiny appointed, so tis willed where will and power are one, ask thou no more. Now gin the rueful wailings to be heard, now am I come where many a plaining voice smites on mine ear, into a place I came where light was silent all, bellowing there groaned a noise as of a sea in tempest torn by warring winds. The stormy blast of hell with restless fury drives the spirits on world round and dashed amain with sore annoy. When they arrive before the ruinous sweep, their shrieks are heard, their lamentations, moans, and blasphemies against the good power in heaven. I understood that to this torment sad the carnal sinners are condemned, in whom reason by lust is swayed, as in large troops and multitudinous when winter reigns, the starlings on their wings are borne abroad so bears the tyrannous gust those evil souls. On this side and on that, above, below, it drives them. Hope of rest to solace them is none, nor e'en of milder pang. As cranes, chanting their dolorous notes, traverse the sky, stretched out in long array, so I beheld spirits who came loud wailing, hurried on by their dire doom. Then I, instructor, who are these by the black air so scourged? The first among those of whom thou questionst, he replied, or many tongues was empress. She in vice of luxury was so shameless that she made liking be lawful by promulg decree to clear the blame she had herself incurred. This is Semiramis, of whom tis writ, that she succeeded Ninus her espoused, and held the land, which now the Soldan rules. The next in amorous fury slew herself, and to Sicius's ashes broke her faith. Then follows Cleopatra, lustful queen. There marked I Helen, for whose sake so long the time was fraught with evil, there the great Achilles, who with love fought to the end. Paris I saw, and Tristan, and beside a thousand more he showed me, and by name pointed them out, whom love bereaved of life. When I had heard my sage instructor name those dames and knights of antique days, or powered by pity, well nigh in amaze my mind was lost, and I began. Barred willingly I would address those two together coming, which seems so light before the wind, he thus, Note thou when nearer they to us approach. Then by that love which carries them along entreat, and they will come. Soon as the wind swayed them toward us, I thus framed my speech. O wearied spirits, come and hold discourse with us, if by none else restrained. As doves by fond desire invited on wide wings and firm to their sweet nest returning home, cleave the air, wafted by their will along. Thus issued from that troop where Dido ranks, they threw the ill air speeding, with such force my cry prevailed by strong affection urged. O gracious creature and benign, 
who ghost visiting through this element obscure, us, who the world with bloody stain imbrued, if for a friend the king of all we owned, our prayer to him should for thy peace arise, since thou hast pity on our evil plight. Of whatsoe'er to hear or to discourse it pleases thee, that will we hear, of that freely with thee discourse, while e'er the wind, as now, is mute. The land that gave me birth is situate on the coast where Poe descends to rest in ocean with his sequent streams. Love that in gentle heart is quickly learnt, entangled him by that fair form, from me tan in such cruel sort, as grieves me still. Love that denial takes from none beloved, caught me with pleasing him so passing well, that as thou seest, he yet deserts me not. Love brought us to one death, Cain awaits the soul, who spilt our life. Such were their words, at hearing which downward I bent my looks, and held them there so long that the bard cried, What art thou pondering? I an answer thus, Alas, by what sweet thoughts, what fond desire must they at length to that ill pass have reached? Then turning I to them my speech addressed, and thus began, Francesca, your sad fate even to tears my grief and pity moves. But tell me, in the time of your sweet sighs, by what and how love granted, that ye knew your yet uncertain wishes? She replied, No greater grief than to remember days of joy when misery is at hand, that kens thy learned instructor. Yet so eagerly if thou art bent to know the primal root, from whence our love gat being I will do as one who weeps and tells his tale. One day for our delight we read of Lancelot, how him love thralled. Alone we were, and no suspicion near us. Oft times by that reading our eyes were drawn together, and the hue fled from our altered cheek. But at one point alone we fell, when of that smile we read, the wished smile rapturously kissed by one so deep in love, then he who ne'er from me shall separate, at once my lips all trembling kissed. The book and writer both were love's purveyors. In its leaves that day we read no more. While thus one spirit spake, the other wailed so sorely that heart struck I through compassion fainting, seemed not far from death, and like a corpse fell to the ground. Canto VI My sense reviving that erewhile had drooped with pity for the kindred shades, whence grief o'ercame me wholly, straight around I see new torments, new tormented souls, which weigh so ere I move or turn or bend my sight. In the third circle I arrive of showers ceaseless, accursed, heavy, and cold, unchanged forever, both in kind and in degree. Large hail, discolored water, sleety flaw through the dun midnight air streamed down amain. Stank all the land whereon that tempest fell. Cerberus, cruel monster, fierce and strange, through his wide threefold throat barks as a dog over the multitude immersed beneath. His eyes glare crimson, black his unctuous beard, his belly large and clawed the hands, with which he tears the spirits, flays them, and their limbs piecemeal disparts. Howling there spread, as curs under the rainy deluge, with one side the other screening, off they roll them round a wretched godless crew. When that great worm descried us, savage Cerberus, he oped his jaws and the fangs showed us, not a limb of him but trembled. Then my guide, his palms expanding on the ground, thence filled with earth raised them and cast it in his ravenous maw. E'en as a dog that yelling bays for food his keeper when the morsel comes lets fall his fury, bent alone with eager haste to swallow it, so dropped the loathsome cheeks of demon Cerberus, who thundering stuns the spirits, that they for deafness wish in vain. We, o'er the shades thrown prostrate by the brunt of the heavy tempest passing, set our feet upon their emptiness, that substance seemed. They all along the earth extended lay save one, that sudden raised himself to sit, soon as that way he saw us pass. O thou, he cried, who through the infernal shades art led, own if again thou knowest me. Thou wast framed, or ere my frame was broken. I replied, The anguish thou endurest perchance so takes thy form from my remembrance, that it seems as if I saw thee never. But inform me who thou art, that in a place so sad art set, and in such torment, that although other be greater, more disgustful none can be imagined. He in answer thus, Thy city heaped with envy to the brim, I that the measure overflows its bounds, held me in brighter days. Ye citizens were wont to name me Chiaco, for the sin of gluttony damned vice beneath this reign, e'en as thou seest I with fatigue am worn. 
nor I sold spirit in this woe. All these have by like crime incurred like punishment. No more, he said, and I my speech resumed. Chiaco, thy dire affliction grieves me much, even to tears. But tell me if thou knowest, what shall at length befall the citizens of the divided city, whether any just one inhabit there? And tell me of the cause, whence jarring discord hath assailed it thus. He then, after long striving they will come to blood, and the wild party from the woods will chase the other with much injury forth. Then it behooves that this must fall within three solar circles, and the other rise by borrowed force of one who under shore now rests. It shall a long space hold aloof its forehead, keeping under heavy weight the other oppressed, indignant at the load, and grieving sore. The just are two in number, but they neglected. Avarice, envy, pride, three fatal sparks have set the hearts of all on fire. Here ceased the lamentable sound, and I continued thus. Still would I learn more from thee, farther parley still entreat. Of Farinata and Tegiayo say, they who so well deserved of Giacopo, Arrigo, Mosca, and the rest, who bent their minds on working good. Oh, tell me where they bide, and to their knowledge let me come. For I am pressed with keen desire to hear, if heaven's sweet cup or poisonous drug of hell be to their lip assigned. He answered straight, These are yet blacker spirits. Various crimes have sunk them deeper in the dark abyss. If thou so far descendest, thou mayst see them. But to the pleasant world when thou returnst, of me make mention, I entreat thee there. No more I tell thee, answer thee no more. This said, his fixed eyes he turned askance. A little eyed me then bent down his head, and midst his blind companions with it fell. When thus my guide, no more his bed he leaves, ere the last angel trumpet blow, the power adverse to these shall then in glory come, each one forthwith to his sad tomb repair, resume his fleshly vesture and his form, and hear the eternal doom re-echoing rend the vault. So passed we through that mixture foul of spirits and rain with tardy steps, meanwhile touching though slightly on the life to come. For thus I questioned, Shall these tortures, sir, when the great sentence passes, be increased or mitigated or as now severe? He then, Consult thy knowledge, that decides that as each thing to more perfection grows, it feels more sensibly both good and pain. Though ne'er to true perfection may arrive this race accursed, yet nearer then than now they shall approach it. Compassing that path. Circuitous we journeyed, and discourse much more than I relate between us past, till at the point where the steps led below arrived there Plutus, the great foe, we found. Canto 7. Ah me, O oh Satan, Satan! loud exclaimed Plutus in accent hoarse of wild alarm. And the kind sage, whom no event surprised, to comfort me thus spake. Let not thy fear harm thee, for power in him be sure is none to hinder down this rock thy safe descent. Then to that sworn lip turning, Peace, he cried, Cursed wolf, thy fury inward on thyself prey and consume thee. Through the dark profound not without cause he passes. So it is willed on high there where the great archangel poured heaven's vengeance on the first adulterer proud. As sails full spread and bellying with the wind, drop suddenly collapsed, if the mast split. So to the ground down dropped the cruel fiend. Thus we, descending to the fourth steep ledge, gained on the dismal shore, that all the woe hems in of all the universe. Ah me, almighty justice, in what store thou heapst new pains, new troubles, as I here beheld. Wherefore doth fault of ours bring us to this? E'en as a billow on Charybdis rising against encountered billow dashing breaks, such is the dance this wretched race must lead, who more than elsewhere numerous here I found, from one side and the other with loud voice, both rolled on weights by main forge of their breasts, then smote together, and each one forthwith rolled them back voluble, turning again, exclaiming these, Why holdest thou so fast? Those answering, And why castest thou away? So still repeating their despiteful song, they to the opposite point on either hand traversed the horrid circle, then arrived, both turned them round, and through the middle space conflicting met again. At sight whereof I, stung with grief, thus spake, O oh, say, my guide, what race is this? Were these whose heads are shorn on our left hand all separate to the church? He straight replied, In their first life these all in mind were so distorted that they made, according to due measure of their wealth, no use. This clearly from their words collect, 
which they howl forth at each extremity arriving of the circle, where their crime contrary in kind disparts them. To the church were separate those that with no hairy cowls are crowned, both popes and cardinals, or whom avarice dominion absolute maintains. I then, mid such as these some needs must be, whom I shall recognize, that with the blot of these foul sins were stained. He answering thus, Vain thought conceivest thou, that ignoble life which made them vile before now makes them dark, and to all knowledge indiscernible. Forever they shall meet in this rude shock. These from the tomb with clenched grasp shall rise, those with close-shaven locks. That ill they gave and ill they kept hath of the beauteous world deprived, and set them at this strife, which needs no labored phrase of mine to set it off. Now mayst thou see, my son, how brief, how vain the goods committed into fortune's hands, for which the human race keeps such a coil. Not all the gold that is beneath the moon or ever hath been of these toil-worn souls might purchase rest for one. I thus rejoined, My guide, of thee this also would I learn, this fortune that thou speak'st of what it is, whose talons grasp the blessings of the world. He thus, O beings blind, what ignorance besets you? Now my judgment here and mark, he whose transcendent wisdom passes all, the heavens creating, gave them ruling powers to guide them, so that each part shines to each, their light in equal distribution poured. By similar appointment he ordained, over the world's bright images to rule superintendents of a guiding hand, and general minister, which at due time may change the empty vantages of life from race to race, from one to other's blood, beyond prevention of man's wisest care. Wherefore one nation rises into sway, another languishes, e'en as her will decrees, from us concealed, as in the grass the serpent train. Against her naught avails your utmost wisdom. She with foresight plans, judges, and carries on her reign, as theirs the other powers divine. Her changes know none intermission. By necessity she is made swift, so frequent come who claim succession in her favors. This is she, so execrated e'en by those whose debt to her is rather praise. They wrongfully with blame requite her, and with evil word. But she is blessed, and for that wrecks not. Amidst the other primal beings glad rolls on her sphere, and in her bliss exults. Now on our way pass we to heavier woe descending, for each star is falling now, that mounted at our entrance, and forbids too long our tarrying. We the circle cross to the next steep, arriving at a well, that boiling pours itself down to a foss sluiced from its source. Far murkier was the wave than sablest grain, and we in company of the inky waters, journeying by their side, entered, though by a different track beneath. Into a lake the Stygian named expands the dismal stream, when it hath reached the foot of the grey withered cliffs. Intent I stood to gaze, and in the marish sunk descried a miry tribe, all naked, and with looks betokening rage. They with their hands alone struck not, but with the head, the breast, the feet, cutting each other piecemeal with their fangs. The good instructor spake, Now seest thou, son, the souls of those whom anger overcame. This too for certain know, that underneath the water dwells a multitude, whose sighs into these bubbles make the surface heave, as thine eye tells thee wheresoe'er it turn. Fixed in the slime, they say, sad once were we in the sweet air made gladsome by the sun, carrying a foul and lazy mist within. Now in these murky settlings are we sad. Such dolorous strain they gurgle in their throats, but word distinct can utter none. Our route thus compassed we, a segment widely stretched between the dry embankment and the core of the loathed pool, turning meanwhile our eyes downward on those who gulped its muddy lees, nor stopped, till to a tower's low base we came. Canto 8 My theme pursuing I relate that ere we reached the lofty turret's base, our eyes its height ascended where two cressets hung we marked, and from afar another light returned the signal so remote that scarce the eye could catch its beam. I turning round to the deep source of knowledge thus inquired, Say what this means, and what that other light in answer set, what agency doth this? There on the filthy waters, he replied, E'en now what next awaits us mayest thou see, if the marsh-gendered fog conceal it not. Never was arrow from the cord dismissed, that ran its way so nimbly through the air, as a small bark, that through the waves I spied toward us coming, 
under the sole sway of one that ferried it, who cried aloud, Art thou arrived, fell spirit? Phlegius, Phlegius, this time thou criest in vain, my lord replied, no longer shalt thou have us, but while o'er the slimy pool we pass. As one who hears of some great wrong he hath sustained, whereat inly he pines, so Phlegius inly pined in his fierce ire. My guide descending stepped into the skiff, and bade me enter next close at his side, nor till my entrance seemed the vessel freighted. Soon as both embarked, cutting the waves goes on the ancient prow, more deeply than with others it is wont. While we our course o'er the dead channel held, one drenched in mire before me came and said, Who art thou that thou comest ere thine hour? I answered, Though I come, I tarry not. But who art thou that art become so foul? One, as thou seest, who mourn, he straight replied, to which I thus, In mourning and in woe, cursed spirit, tarry thou, I know thee well, e'en thus in filth disguised. Then stretched he forth hands to the bark, whereof my teacher sage aware, thrusting him back, away, down there, to the other dogs. Then with his arms my neck encircling kissed my cheek and spake, O soul, justly disdainful, blessed was she in whom thou was conceived. He in the world was one for arrogance noted, to his memory no virtue lends its luster. Even so here is his shadow furious. There above how many now hold themselves mighty kings, who here like swine shall wallow in the mire, leaving behind them horrible dispraise. I then, Master, him fain would I behold whelmed in these dregs before we quit the lake. He thus, or ever to thy view the shore be offered, satisfied shall be that wish, which well deserves completion. Scarce his words were ended, when I saw the miry tribe set on him with such violence, that yet for that render I thanks to God and praise, to Filippo Argenti, cried they all, and on himself the moody Florentine turned his avenging fangs. Him here we left, nor speak I of him more, but on mine ear sudden a sound of lamentation smote, whereat mine eye unbarred I sent abroad, and thus the good instructor, now, my son, draws near the city that of Dis is named, with its grave denizens a mighty throng. I thus, the minarets already, sir, their certes in the valley I descry, gleaming vermilion, as if they from fire had issued. He replied, Eternal fire that inward burns, shows them with ruddy flame illumed, as in this nether hell thou seest. We came within the fosses deep, that moat, this region comfortless. The walls appeared as they were framed of iron. We had made wide circuit, ere a place we reached, where loud the mariner cried vehement, Go forth, the entrance is here. Upon the gates I spied more than a thousand, who of old from heaven were hurled, with ireful gestures. Who is this, they cried, that without death first felt, goes through the regions of the dead? My sapient guide made sign that he for secret parley wished, whereat their angry scorn abating, thus they spake. Come thou alone, and let him go who hath so hardily entered this realm. Alone return he by his witless way. If well he know it, let him prove. For thee, here shalt thou tarry, who through clime so dark hast been his escort. Now bethink thee, reader, what cheer was mine at sound of those cursed words. I did believe I never should return. O my loved guide, who more than seven times security hast rendered me, and drawn from peril deep, whereto I stood exposed, Desert me not, I cried, in this extreme, and if our onward going be denied, together trace we back our steps with speed. My liege, who thither had conducted me, replied, Fear not, for of our passage none hath power to disappoint us, by such high authority permitted. But do thou expect me here. Meanwhile thy wearied spirit comfort, and feed with kindly hope, assured I will not leave thee in this lower world. This said departs the sire benevolent and quits me. Hesitating I remain at war twixt will and will not in my thoughts. I could not hear what terms he offered them, but they conferred not long for all at once to trial fled within. Closed were the gates by those our adversaries on the breast of my liege lord. Excluded he returned to me with tardy steps. Upon the ground his eyes were bent, and from his brow erased all confidence, while thus with sighs he spake, Who hath denied me these abodes of woe? Then thus to me, that I am angered, think no ground of terror. In this trial I shall vanquish, use what arts they may within for hindrance. This their insolence not new, erewhile at gate less secret they displayed, which still is without bolt. 
Upon its arch thou sawest the deadly scroll, and even now on this side of its entrance down the steep, passing the circles unescorted, comes one whose strong might can open us this land. Canto 9 The hue which coward dread on my pale cheeks imprinted when I saw my guide turn back, chased that from his which newly they had worn, and inwardly restrained it. He as one who listens stood attentive, for his eye not far could lead him through the sable air and the thick gathering cloud. It yet behooves we win this fight, thus he began. If not, such aid to us is offered. Oh, how long me seems it ere the promised help arrive. I noted how the sequel of his words cloaked their beginning, for the last he spake agreed not with the first. But not the less my fear was at his saying, Sith I drew to import worse perchance than that he held, his mutilated speech. Doth ever any into this rueful concave's extreme depth descend, out of the first degree, whose pain is deprivation merely of sweet hope? Thus I inquiring. Rarely, he replied, it chances that among us any makes this journey which I wend. Erewhile tis true, once came I here beneath, conjured by fell Erichtho sorceress, who compelled the shades back to their bodies. No long space my flesh was naked of me, when within these walls she made me enter, to draw forth a spirit from out of Judas's circle. Lowest place is that of all obscurest and removed, farthest from heaven's all-circling orb. The road full well I know, thou therefore rest secure. That lake the noisome stench exhaling round the city of grief encompasses, which now we may not enter without rage. Yet more, he added, but I hold it not in mind, for that mine eye toward the lofty tower had drawn me wholly to its burning top where in an instant I beheld uprisen at once three hellish furies stained with blood. In limb and motion feminine they seemed. Around them greenest hydras twisting rolled their volumes. Adders and serastes crept instead of hair, and their fierce temples bound. He knowing well the miserable hags who tend the queen of endless woe, thus spake. Mark thou each dire Erinys. To the left this is Megaera, on the right hand she who wails Alecto, and Tisiphone i' the midst. This said, in silence he remained. Their breast they each one clawing tore, themselves smote with their palms, and such shrill clamor raised, that to the bard I clung suspicion bound. Hasten, Medusa, so to adamant him shall we change, all looking down exclaimed. E'en when by Theseus's might assailed, we took no ill revenge. Turn thyself round and keep thy countenance hid, for if the gorgon dire be shown and thou shouldst view it, thy return upwards would be forever lost. This said, himself my gentle master turned me round, nor trusted he my hands, but with his own he also hid me. Ye of intellect sound and entire, mark well the lore concealed under close texture of the mystic strain. And now there came o'er the perturbed waves loud crashing terrible, a sound that made either shore tremble, as if of a wind impetuous from conflicting vapors sprung, that gainst some forest driving all its might plucks off the branches, beats them down, and hurls afar. Then onward, passing proudly, sweeps its whirlwind rage, while beasts and shepherds fly. Mine eyes he loosed and spake, and now direct thy visual nerve along that ancient foam, there thickest where the smoke ascends. As frogs before their foe the serpent through the wave ply swiftly all, till at the ground each one lies on a heap, more than a thousand spirits destroyed. So saw I fleeing before one who passed with unwet feet the Stygian sound. He, from his face removing the gross air, oft his left hand forth stretched, and seemed alone by that annoyance wearied. I perceived that he was sent from heaven, and to my guide turned me, who signal made that I should stand quiet and bend to him. Ah me, how full of noble anger seemed he! To the gate he came, and with his wand touched it, whereat open without impediment it flew. Outcasts of heaven, O abject race and scorned, began he on the horrid grunsel standing, whence doth this wild excess of insolence lodge in you? Wherefore kick you gainst that will ne'er frustrate of its end, and which so oft hath laid on you enforcement of your pangs? What profits at the phase to but the horn? Your Cerberus, if ye remember, hence bears still, peeled of their hair his throat and maw. This said he turned back o'er the filthy way, and syllable to us spake none but wore the semblance of a man by other care beset, and keenly pressed, than thought of him who in his presence stands. Then we our steps toward that territory moved, secure after the hallowed words. We unopposed there entered, 
and my mind eager to learn what state a fortress like to that might hold, I soon as entered throw mine eye around, and see on every part wide-stretching space replete with bitter pain and torment ill. As where Rhone stagnates on the plains of Arles, or as at Pola, near Quarnaro's gulf, that closes Italy and laves her bounds, the place is all thick spread with sepulchres. So was it here, save what in horror here excelled. For midst the graves were scattered flames, wherewith intensely all throughout they burned, that iron for no craft their hotter needs. Their lids all hung suspended, and beneath from them forth issued lamentable moans, such as the sad and tortured well might raise. I thus, Master, say who are these interred within these vaults, of whom distinct we hear the dolorous sighs. He answer thus returned, The arch-heretics are here, accompanied by every sect their followers, and much more than thou believest, tombs are freighted, like with like is buried, and the monuments are different in degrees of heat. This said, he to the right hand turning, on we passed betwixt the afflicted and the ramparts high. Canto 10. Now by a secret pathway we proceed, between the walls that hem the region round, and the tormented souls. My master first I close behind his steps. Virtue supreme I thus began, who through these ample orbs in circuit leadst me, even as thou wilt, speak thou and satisfy my wish. May those who lie within these sepulchres be seen. Already all the lids are raised, and none o'er them keeps watch. He thus in answer spake, They shall be closed all, what time they hear from Joseph at return shall come, and bring their bodies, which above they now have left. The cemetery on this part obtain with Epicurus all his followers, who with the body make the spirit die. Here therefore satisfaction shall be soon both to the question asked, and to the wish, which thou concealst in silence. I replied, I keep not, guide beloved, from thee my heart secreted, but to shun vain length of words, a lesson erewhile taught me by thyself. O Tuscan, thou who through the city of fire alive art passing so discreet of speech, here please thee stay a while. Thy utterance declares the place of thy nativity to be that noble land, with which perchance I too severely dealt. Sudden that sound forth issued from a vault, whereat in fear I somewhat closer to my leader's side approaching, he thus spake, What dost thou? Turn! Lo, Farinata there, who hath himself uplifted, from his girdle upwards all exposed behold him. On his face was mine already fixed, his breast and forehead there erecting, seemed as in high scorn he held e'en hell. Between the sepulchres to him my guide thrust me with fearless hands and prompt, this warning added, See thy words be clear. He soon as there I stood at the tomb's foot, aid me a space, then in disdainful mood addressed me, Say what ancestors were thine. I, willing to obey him, straight revealed the whole, nor kept back aught, whence he, his brow somewhat uplifting, cried, Fiercely were they adverse to me, my party, and the blood from whence I sprang, twice therefore I abroad scattered them. Though driven out, yet they each time from all parts, answered I, returned, an art which yours have shown, they are not skilled to learn. Then peering forth from the unclosed jaw, rose from his side a shade high as the chin, leaning, methought, upon its knees upraised. It looked around as eager to explore if there were other with me, but perceiving that fond imagination quenched with tears thus spake, If thou through this blind prison goest, led by thy lofty genius and profound, where is my son, and wherefore not with thee? I straight replied, Not of myself I come by him, who there expects me, through this climb conducted, whom perchance Guido thy son had in contempt. Already had his words, and mode of punishment read me his name, whence I so fully answered. He at once exclaimed, upstarting, How, saidst thou he had, no longer lives he, strikes not on his eye the blessed daylight. Then of some delay I made, ere my reply aware, down fell supine, not after forth appeared he more. Meanwhile the other, great of soul, near whom I yet was stationed, changed not countenance stern, nor moved the neck, nor bent his ribbed side. And if, continuing the first discourse, they in this art, he cried, small skill have shown, that doth torment me more e'en than this bed. But not yet fifty times shall be relumed her aspect, who reigns here queen of this realm, ere thou shalt know the full weight of that art. So to the pleasant world mayst thou return, as thou shalt tell me, 
why in all their laws against my kin this people is so fell. The slaughter and great havoc, I replied, that colored Arbia's flood with crimson stain, to these impute that in our hallowed dome such orisons ascend. Sighing he shook the head, then thus resumed, In that affray I stood not singly, nor without just cause assuredly should with the rest have stirred. But singly there I stood, when by consent of all Florence had to the ground been raised, the one who openly forbade the deed. So may thy lineage find at last repose, I thus adjured him, as thou solve this knot, which now involves my mind. If right I hear, ye seem to view beforehand, that which time leads with him, of the present uninformed. We view as one who hath an evil sight, he answered, plainly objects far remote. So much of his large spendar yet imparts the Almighty Ruler. But when they approach or actually exist, our intellect then wholly fails, nor of your human state, except what others bring us know we ought. Hence therefore mayest thou understand that all our knowledge in that instant shall expire when on futurity the portals close. Then conscious of my fault, and by remorse smitten, I added thus, Now shalt thou say to him there fallen, that his offspring still is to the living joined, and bid him know that if from answer silent I abstained, t'was that my thought was occupied intent upon that error which thy help hath solved. But now my master summoning me back I heard, and with more eager haste besought the spirit to inform me who with him partook his lot. He answer thus returned, More than a thousand with me here are laid within is Frederick, second of that name, and the Lord Cardinal, and of the rest I speak not. He this said from sight withdrew, but I my steps towards the ancient bard reverting, ruminated on the words betokening me such ill. Onward he moved, and thus in going questioned, Whence the amaze that holds thy senses rapt? I satisfied the inquiry, and the sage enjoined me straight. Let thy safe memory store what thou hast heard to thee importing harm, and note thou this, with his raised finger bidding me take heed, when thou shalt stand before her gracious beam, whose bright eye all surveys, she of thy life the future tenor will to thee unfold. Forthwith he to the left hand turned his feet, we left the wall and towards the middle space went by a path that to a valley strikes, which e'en thus high exhaled its noisome steam. Canto 11. Upon the utmost verge of a high bank, by craggy rocks environed round we came, where woes beneath more cruel yet were stowed, and here to shun the horrible excess of fetid exhalation, upward cast from the profound abyss, behind the lid of a great monument we stood retired, where on this scroll I marked. I have in charge Pope Anastasius, whom Photinus drew from the right path. Ere our descent behooves we make delay, that somewhat first the sense, to the dire breath accustomed, afterward regard it not. My master thus, to whom answering I spake, some compensation find that the time passed not wholly lost. He then, Lo, how my thoughts e'en to thy wishes tend. My son, within these rocks, he thus began, are three close circles in gradation placed, as these which now thou leavest. Each one is full of spirits accursed, but that the sight alone hereafter may suffice thee. Listen how and for what cause endurance they abide. Of all malicious act abhorred in heaven, the end is injury, and all such end either by force or fraud works others' woe, but fraud because of man peculiar evil, to God is more displeasing, and beneath the fraudulent are therefore doomed to endure severer pang. The violent occupy all the first circle, and because to force three persons are obnoxious, in three rounds each within other separate is it framed. To God his neighbor and himself by man force may be offered, to himself I say, and his possessions, as thou soon shalt hear at full. Death, violent death, and painful wounds upon his neighbor he inflicts, and wastes by devastation, pillage, and the flames, his substance. Slayers and each one that smites in malice, plunderers and all robbers, hence the torment undergo of the first round in different herds. Man can do violence to himself and his own blessings, and for this he in the second round must I deplore with unavailing penitence his crime, who where deprives himself of life and light in reckless lavishment his talent wastes, and sorrows there where he should dwell in joy. To God may force be offered, in the heart denying and blaspheming his high power, 
and nature with her kindly law contemning. And thence the inmost round marks with its seal, Sodom and Cahors, and all such as speak contemptuously of the Godhead in their hearts. Fraud, that in every conscience leaves a sting, may be by man employed on one, whose trust he wins, or on another who withholds strict confidence. Seems as the latter way broke but the bond of love which nature makes. Whence in the second circle have their nest, dissimulation, witchcraft, flatteries, theft, falsehood, simony, all who seduce to lust, or set their honesty at pawn, with such vile scum as these. The other way forgets both nature's general love, and that which thereto added afterwards gives birth to special faith. Whence in the lesser circle, point of the universe, dread seat of dis, the traitor is eternally consumed. I thus, instructor clearly thy discourse proceeds, distinguishing the hideous chasm and its inhabitants with skill exact. But tell me this, they of the dull, fat pool, whom the rain beats, or whom the tempest drives, or who with tongue so fierce conflicting meet, wherefore within the city fire illumed are not these punished, if God's wrath be on them? And if it be not, wherefore in such guise are they condemned? He answer thus returned. Wherefore in dotage wanders thus thy mind, not so accustomed, or what other thoughts possess it? Dwell not in thy memory the words wherein thy ethic page describes three dispositions adverse to heaven's will, incontinence, malice, and mad brutishness, and how incontinence the least offends God, and least guilt incurs. If well thou note this judgment, and remember who they are, without these walls to vain repentance doomed, thou shalt discern why they apart are placed from these fell spirits, and less reekful pours justice divine on them its vengeance down. O son, who healest all imperfect sight, thou so contentst me when thou solvest my doubt, that ignorance not less than knowledge charms. Yet somewhat turn thee back, I in these words continued, where thou saidst, that usury offends celestial goodness, and this not perplexed unravel. He thus made reply, Philosophy, to an attentive ear, clearly points out not in one part alone, how imitative nature takes her course from the celestial mind and from its art, and where her laws the stagirite unfolds, not many leaves scanned o'er, observing well thou shalt discover, that your art on her obsequious follows, as the learner treads in his instructor's step so that your art deserves the name of second in descent from God. These two, if thou recall to mind creation's holy book, from the beginning were the right source of life and excellence to humankind. But in another path the usurer walks, and nature in herself, and in her follower thus he sets at naught, placing elsewhere his hope. But follow now my steps on forward journey bent, for now the Pisces play with undulating glance along the horizon, and the wane lies all o'er the northwest and onward there a space is our steep passage down the rocky height. Canto 12 The place where to descend the precipice we came was rough as Alp, and on its verge such object lay as every eye would shun, as is that ruin which Addis's stream on this side Trento struck, shuddering the wave, or loosed by earthquake or for lack of prop, for from the mountain's summit whence it moved to the low level, so the headlong rock is shivered, that some passage it might give to him who from above would pass. E'en such into the chasm was that descent, and there at point of the disparted ridge lay stretched the infamy of Crete, detested brood of the feigned heifer, and at sight of us it gnawed itself as one with rage distract. To him my guide exclaimed, Perchance thou deemst the king of Athens here who in the world above thy death contrived, monster, avaunt, he comes not tutored by thy sister's art, but to behold your torments is he come, like to a bull, that with impetuous spring darts, at the moment when the fatal blow hath struck him, but unable to proceed plunges on either side. So saw I plunge the minotaur, whereat the sage exclaimed, Run to the passage, while he storms, tis well that thou descend. Thus down our road we took through those dilapidated crags, that oft moved underneath my feet, to wait like theirs unused. I pondering went, and thus he spake. Perhaps thy thoughts are of this ruined steep, guarded by the brute violence which I have vanquished now. Know then that when I erst hither descended to the nether hell, this rock was not yet fallen. But past doubt, if well I mark, not long ere he arrived, who carried off from dis the mighty spoil of the highest circle, 
then through all its bounds. Such trembling seized the deep concave and foul. I thought the universe was thrilled with love, whereby there are who deem the world hath oft been into chaos turned. And in that point here and elsewhere that old rock toppled down. But fix thine eyes beneath, the river of blood approaches, in the which all those are steeped, who have by violence injured. O blind lust, O foolish wrath, who so dost goad us on in the brief life, and in the eternal then thus miserably o'erwhelm us. I beheld an ample fosse that in a bow was bent, as circling all the plain, for so my guide had told. Between it and the rampart's base on trail ran centaurs, with keen arrows armed, as to the chase they on the earth were wont. At seeing us descend, they each one stood, and issuing from the troop, three sped with bows and missile weapons chosen first, of whom one cried from far. Say to what pain ye come condemned, who down this steep have journeyed. Speak from whence ye stand, or else the bow I draw. To whom my guide, our answer shall be made to Chiron there when nearer him we come. Ill was thy mind thus ever quick and rash. Then me he touched and spake. Nessus is this, who for the fair Deianira died, and wrought himself revenge for his own fate. He in the midst, that on his breast looks down is the great Chiron who Achilles nursed, that other Pholus, prone to wrath. Around the fosse these go by thousands, aiming shafts at whatsoever spirit dares emerge from out the blood, more than his guilt allows. We to those beasts, that rapid strode along, drew near, when Chiron took an arrow forth, and with the notch pushed back his shaggy beard to the cheekbone, then his great mouth to view, exposing, to his fellows thus exclaimed, Are ye aware that he who comes behind moves what he touches? The feet of the dead are not so wont. My trusty guide, who now stood near his breast, where the two natures join, thus made reply, He is indeed alive, and solitary so must needs by me be shown the gloomy veil, thereto induced by strict necessity, not by delight. She left her joyful harpings in the sky, who this new office to my care consigned. He is no robber, no dark spirit I, but by that virtue which empowers my step to treat so wild a path, grant us, I pray, one of thy band, whom we may trust secure, who to the ford may lead us, and convey across him mounted on his back, for he is not a spirit that may walk the air. Then on his right breast turning, Chiron thus to Nessus spake, Return and be their guide, and if ye chance to cross another troop, command them keep aloof. Onward we moved, the faithful escort by our side along the border of the crimson seething flood, whence from those steeped within loud shrieks arose. Some there I marked as high as to their brow immersed, of whom the mighty centaur thus, These are the souls of tyrants who were given to blood and rapine. Here they wail aloud their merciless wrongs. Here Alexander dwells and Dionysius fell, who many a year of woe wrought for fair Sicily. That brow whereon the hair so jetty clustering hangs is Azolino that with flaxen locks Obizo of Este in the world destroyed by his foul stepson. To the bard revered I turned me round, and thus he spake, Let him be to thee now first leader, me but next to him in rank. Then farther on a space the centaur paused near some, who at the throat were extant from the wave, and showing us a spirit by itself apart retired, exclaimed, He in God's bosom smote the heart, which yet is honoured on the bank of Thames. A race I next espied, who held the head, and even all the bust above the stream. Midst these I many a face remembered well. Thus shallow more and more the blood became, so that at last it but imbrued the feet, and there our passage lay athwart the fosse. As ever on this side the boiling wave thou seest diminishing, the centaur said, so on the other, be thou well assured, it lower still and lower sinks its bed, till in that part it reuniting join where it is the lot of tyranny to mourn. There heaven's stern justice lays chastising hand on Attila, who was the scourge of earth, on Sextus, and on Pyrrhus, and extracts tears ever by the seething flood unlocked from the Rinieri, of Cornetto this, Pazzo the other named, who filled the ways with violence and war. This said he turned, and quitting us, alone repassed the ford. Canto 13 Ere Nessus yet had reached the other bank, we entered on a forest, where no track of steps had worn away. Not verdant there the foliage but of dusky hue, 
not light the boughs and tapering, but with nares deformed and matted thick. Fruits there were none, but thorns instead, with venom filled. Less sharp than these, less intricate the breaks, wherein abide those animals that hate the cultured fields, betwixt Cornetto and Cecina's stream. Here the brute harpies make their nest, the same who from the strophades the Trojan band drove with dire boding of their future woe. Broad are their pennons of the human form, their neck and countenance, armed with talons keen the feet, and the huge belly fledge with wings, these sit and wail on the drear mystic wood. The kind instructor in these words began, Ere farther thou proceed, know thou art now I the second round, and shalt be till thou come upon the horrid sand. Look therefore well around thee, and such things thou shalt behold, as would my speech discredit. On all sides I heard sad plainings breathe, and none could see from whom they might have issued. In a maze fast bound I stood. He, as it seemed, believed, that I had thought so many voices came from some amid those thickets close concealed, and thus his speech resumed. If thou lop off a single twig from one of those ill plants, the thought thou hast conceived shall vanish quite. Thereat a little stretching forth my hand, from a great wilding gathered I a branch, and straight the trunk exclaimed, Why pluckst thou me? Then as the dark blood trickled down its side, these words it added, Wherefore tearst me thus? Is there no touch of mercy in thy breast? Men once were we that now are rooted here. Thy hand might well have sparred us had we been the souls of serpents. As a brand yet green, that burning at one end from the other sends a groaning sound, and hisses with the wind that forces out its way, so burst at once, forth from the broken splinter words and blood. I, letting fall the bow, remained as one assailed by terror, and the sage replied, If he, O injured spirit, could have believed what he hath seen but in my verse described, he never against thee had stretched his hand. But I, because the thing surpassed belief, prompted him to this deed, which even now myself I rue. But tell me who thou wast, that for this wrong to do thee some amends, in the upper world, for thither to return is granted him, thy fame he may revive. That pleasant word of thine, the trunk replied, hath so inveigled me, that I from speech cannot refrain, wherein if I indulge a little longer in the snare detained, count it not grievous. I it was, who held both keys to Frederick's heart, and turned the wards, opening and shutting with a skill so sweet, that besides me into his inmost breast, scarce any other could admittance find. The faith I bore to my high charge was such, it cost me the lifeblood that warmed my veins. The harlot, who ne'er turned her gloating eyes from Caesar's household, common vice and pest of courts, gainst me inflamed the minds of all. And to Augustus they so spread the flame, that my glad honors changed to bitter woes. My soul, disdainful and disgusted, sought refuge in death from scorn, and I became, just as I was, unjust toward myself. By the new roots which fix this stem, I swear, that never faith I broke to my liege lord, who merited such honor, and of you, if any to the world indeed return, clear he from wrong my memory, that lies yet prostrate under envy's cruel blow. First somewhat pausing till the mournful words were ended, then to me the bard began, Lose not the time, but speak and of him ask, if more thou wish to learn. Whence I replied, Question thou him again of whatsoe'er will as thou think'st, content me, for no power have I to ask, such pity is at my heart. He thus resumed, So may he do for thee freely what thou entreatest as thou yet be pleased, imprisoned spirit, to declare how in these gnarled joints the soul is tied, and whether any ever from such frame be loosened if thou canst, that also tell. Thereat the trunk breathed hard, and the wind soon changed into sounds articulate like these, briefly ye shall be answered. When departs the fierce soul from the body, by itself thence torn asunder, to the seventh gulf by Minos doomed, into the wood it falls, no place assigned, but wheresoever chance hurls it, there sprouting as a grain of spelt, it rises to a sapling, growing thence a savage plant. The harpies on its leaves then feeding, cause both pain and for the pain a vent to grief. We as the rest shall come for our own spoils, yet not so that with them we may again be clad. For what a man takes from himself it is not just he have. Here we perforce shall drag them, and throughout the dismal glade our bodies shall be hung, each on the wild thorn of his wretched shade.
attentive yet to listen to the trunk we stood, expecting farther speech, when us a noise surprised, as when a man perceives the wild boar and the hunt approach his place of stationed watch, who of the beasts and boughs loud rustling round him hears. And lo, there came two naked, torn with briars in headlong flight, that they before them broke each fan of the wood. Haste now, the foremost cried, now haste thee death. The other as seemed impatient of delay, exclaiming, Lano, not so bent for speed thy sinews in the lists of Topo's field. And then for that perchance no longer breath sufficed him, of himself and of a bush one group he made. Behind them was the wood full of black female mastiffs, gaunt and fleet, as greyhounds that have newly slipped the leash. On him, who squatted down, they stuck their fangs, and having rent him piecemeal, bore away the tortured limbs. My guide then seized my hand and led me to the thicket, which in vain mourned through its bleeding wounds. O Giacomo of Sant'Andrea, what avails it thee, it cried, that of me thou hast made thy screen, for thy ill life what blame on me recoils. When o'er it he had paused, my master spake, Say who wast thou, that at so many points breathed out with blood thy lamentable speech? He answered, O ye spirits, arrived in time to spy the shameful havoc, that from me my leaves hath severed thus, gather them up, and at the foot of their sad parent tree carefully lay them. In that city I dwelt, who for the Baptist her first patron changed, whence he for this shall cease not with his art to work her woe. And if there still remain not on Arno's passage some faint glimpse of him, those citizens who reared once more her walls upon the ashes left by Attila, had labored without profit of their toil. I slung the fatal noose from my own roof. Canto 14. Soon as the charity of native land wrought in my bosom, I the scattered leaves collected, and to him restored, who now was hoarse with utterance. To the limit thence we came, which from the third the second round divides, and where of justice is displayed, contrivance horrible. Things then first seen clearly are to manifest. I tell how next a plain we reached, that from its sterile bed each plant repelled. The mournful wood waves round its garland on all sides, as round the wood spreads the sad foss. There, on the very edge, our steps we stayed. It was an area wide of arid sand and thick, resembling most the soil that erst by Cato's foot was trod. Vengeance of heaven! Oh, how shouldst thou be feared by all who read what here my eyes beheld? Of naked spirits many a flock I saw, all weeping piteously to different laws subjected, for on the earth some lay supine, some crouching close were seated, others paked incessantly around. The latter tribe, more numerous, those fewer who beneath the torment lay, but louder in their grief. O'er all the sand fell slowly wafting down dilated flakes of fire, as flakes of snow on alpine summit, when the wind is hushed. As in the torrid Indian clime, the son of Ammon saw upon his warrior band, descending, solid flames, that to the ground came down. Whence he bethought him with his troop to trample on the soil. For easier thus the vapor was extinguished while alone, so fell the eternal fiery flood, wherewith the marble glowed underneath, as under stove the viands, doubly to augment the pain. Unceasing was the play of wretched hands, now this, now that way glancing to shake off the heat, still falling fresh. I thus began. Instructor, thou who all things overcomest except the hardy demons that rushed forth to stop our entrance at the gate, say who is yon huge spirit, that as seems heeds not the burning but lies writhen in proud scorn, as by the sultry tempest immatured. Straight he himself, who was aware I asked my guide of him, exclaimed, Such as I was when living dead such now I am. If Jove weary his workmen out, from whom in ire he snatched the lightnings, that at my last day transfixed me, if the rest be weary out at their black smithy laboring by turns in Mongebello, while he cries aloud, Help, help, good Mulciber! As erst he cried in the Phlegrian warfare and the bolt's launch he full aimed at me with all his might, he never should enjoy a sweet revenge. Then thus my guide in accent higher raised than I before had heard him, Capaneus, thou art more punished in that this thy pride lives yet unquenched. No torrent save thy rage were to thy fury pain proportioned full. Next turning round to me with milder lip he spake, This of the seven kings was one, who girt the Theban walls with siege, and held, 
as still he seems to hold, God in disdain, and sets his high omnipotence at naught. But as I told him, his despiteful mood is ornament well suits the breast that wears it. Follow me now, and look thou set not yet thy foot in the hot sand, but to the wood keep ever close. Silently on we passed, to where there gushes from the forest's bound a little brook, whose crimsoned wave yet lifts my hair with horror. As the rill that runs from Bulakame to be portioned out among the sinful women, so ran this down through the sand, its bottom and each bank stone built, and either margin at its side, whereon I straight perceived our passage lay. Of all that I have shown thee, since that gate we entered first, whose threshold is to none denied, naught else so worthy of regard, as is this river, has thine eye discerned, o'er which the flaming volley all is quenched. So spake my guide, and I him thence besought, that having given me appetite to know, the food he too would give, that hunger craved. In midst of ocean, forthwith he began, a desolate country lies, which Crete is named, under whose monarch in old times the world lived pure and chaste. A mountain rises there, called Ida, joyous once with leaves and streams, deserted now like a forbidden thing. It was the spot which Rhea, Saturn's spouse, chose for the secret cradle of her son, and better to conceal him drowned in shouts his infant cries. Within the mount upright an ancient form there stands and huge, that turns his shoulders towards Damiata, and at Rome as in his mirror looks. Of finest gold his head is shaped, pure silver are the breast and arms, thence to the middle is of brass, and downward all beneath well-tempered steel, save the right foot of potter's clay, on which than on the other more erect he stands, each part except the gold is rent throughout, and from the fissure tears distill, which joined penetrate to that cave. They in their course thus far precipitated down the rock form Acheron and Styx and Phlegathon, then by this straitened channel passing hence beneath, e'en to the lowest depth of all, form there Cositus, of whose lake thyself shall see it, I here give thee no account. Then I to him, if from our world this sluice be thus derived, wherefore to us but now appears it at this edge? He straight replied, The place thou knowest is round, and though great part thou have already passed, still to the left descending to the nethermost, not yet hast thou the circuit made of the whole orb. Wherefore, if aught of new to us appear, it needs not bring up wonder in thy looks. Then I again inquired, Where flow the streams of Phlegathon and Lethe? For of one thou tellest not, and the other of that shower thou sayest is formed. He answer thus returned, Doubtless thy questions all well pleased I hear, yet the red seething wave might have resolved one thou proposest. Lethe thou shalt see, but not within this hollow in the place, whither to lave themselves the spirits go, whose blame hath been by penitence removed. He added, Time is now we quit the wood. Look thou my steps pursue. The margins give safe passage, unimpeded by the flames, for over them all vapor is extinct. Canto 15 One of the solid margins bears us now enveloped in the mist, that from the stream arising hovers o'er, and saves from fire both piers and water. As the Flemings rear their mound, twixt Ghent and Bruges, to chase back the ocean, fearing his tumultuous tide that drives toward them, or the Paduans theirs along the Brenta, to defend their towns and castles, ere the genial warmth be felt on Chiarantana's top. Such were the mounds, so framed, though not in height or bulk to these made equal, by the master whosoe'er he was, that raised them here. We from the wood were not so far removed, that turning round I might not have discerned it, when we met a troop of spirits who came beside the pier. They each one eyed us, as at eventide one eyes another under a new moon, and toward us sharpened their sight as keen as an old tailor at his needle's eye. Thus narrowly explored by all the tribe, I was agnized of one, who by the skirt caught me and cried, What wonder have we here? And I, when he to me outstretched his arm, intently fixed my ken on his parched looks, that although smirched with fire, they hindered not. But I remembered him, and towards his face my hand inclining answered, Sir, Brunetto, and art thou here? He thus to me, My son, oh, let it not displease thee, if Brunetto Latini but a little space with thee turn back, and leave his fellows to proceed. I thus to him replied, Much as I can, I thereto pray thee, and if thou be willing that I here seat me with thee, I consent, 
his leave with whom I journey first obtained. O son, said he, whoever of this throng one instant stops lies then a hundred years, no fan to ventilate him when the fire smites sorest. Pass thou therefore on. I close will at thy garments walk, and then rejoin my troop, who go mourning their endless doom. I dared not from the path descend to tread on equal ground with him, but held my head bent down, as one who walks in reverent guise. What chance or destiny, thus he began, ere the last day conducts thee here below? And who is this, that shows to thee the way? There up aloft, I answered, in the life serene, I wandered in a valley lost, before mine age had to its fullness reached. But yestermorn I left it, then once more into that vale returning him I met, and by this path homeward he leads me back. If thou, he answered, follow but thy star, thou canst not miss at last a glorious haven, unless in fairer days my judgment erred, and if my fate so early had not chanced, seeing the heavens thus bounteous to thee, I had gladly given thee comfort in thy work. But that ungrateful and malignant race, who in old times came down from Fesole, ay, and still smack of their rough mountain flint, will for thy good deeds show thee enmity. Nor wonder, for amongst ill-savoured crabs it suits not the sweet fig tree lay her fruit. Old fame reports them in the world for blind, covetous, envious, proud. Look to it well, take heed thou cleanse thee of their ways. For thee thy fortune hath such honour in reserve, that thou by either party shalt be craved with hunger keen, but be the fresh herb far from the goat's tooth. The herd of Fesoli may of themselves make litter, not touch the plant, if any such yet spring on their rank bed, in which the holy seed revives, transmitted from those true Romans, who still there remained, when it was made the nest of so much ill. Were all my wish fulfilled, I straight replied, thou from the confines of man's nature yet hadst not been driven forth, for in my mind is fixed, and now strikes full upon my heart the dear, benign, paternal image, such as thine was, when so lately thou didst teach me the way for man to win eternity, and how I prize the lesson it behooves, that long as life endures my tongue should speak, what of my faith thou tellest that write I down, and with another text to comment on for her I keep it, the celestial dame, who will know all if I to her arrive. This only would I have thee clearly note, that so my conscience have no plea against me. Do fortune as she list, I stand prepared, not new or strange such earnest to mine ear. Speed fortune then her wheel, as likes her best the clown his mattock, all things have their course. Thereat my sapient guide upon his right turned himself back, then looked at me and spake, he listens to good purpose who takes note. I not the less still on my way proceed, discoursing with Brunetto, and inquire who are most known and chief among his tribe. To know of some is well, thus he replied, but of the rest silence may best beseem. Time would not serve us for report so long. In brief I tell thee that all these were clerks, men of great learning and no less renown, by one same sin polluted in the world. With them is Priscian, and Accorso's son Francesco herds among that wretched throng. And if the wish of so impure a blotch possessed thee, him thou also mightst have seen, who by the servant's servant was transferred from Arno's seat to Bacciglione, where his ill-strained nerves he left. I more would add, but must from farther speech and onward way alike desist, for yonder I behold a mist new risen on the sandy plain, a company with whom I may not sort approaches. I commend my treasure to thee wherein I yet survive, my sole request. This said he turned, and seemed as one of those, who o'er Verona's champagne try their speed for the green mantle, and of them he seemed, not he who loses but who gains the prize. Canto 16 Now came I where the water's din was heard, as down it fell into the other round, resounding like the hum of swarming bees, when forth together issued from a troop that passed beneath the fierce tormenting storm, three spirits running swift. They towards us came, and each one cried aloud, O oh, do thou stay, whom by the fashion of thy garb we deem to be some inmate of our evil land. Ah me, what wounds I marked upon their limbs, recent and old, inflicted by the flames! E'en the remembrance of them grieves me yet. Attentive to their cry my teacher paused, and turned to me his visage, and then spake, Wait now, our courtesy these merit well, 
and were it not for the nature of the place, whence glide the fiery darts, I should have said that haste had better suited thee than them. They, when we stopped, resumed their ancient wail, and soon as they had reached us, all the three whirled round together in one restless wheel. As naked champions, smeared with slippery oil, are wont intent to watch their place of hold and vantage, ere in closer strife they meet, thus each one as he wheeled, his countenance at me directed, so that opposite the neck moved ever to the twinkling feet. If misery of this drear wilderness, thus one began, added to our sad cheer and destitute, do call forth scorn on us and our entreaties, let our great renown incline thee to inform us who thou art, that dost imprint with living feet unharmed the soil of hell. He, in whose track thou seest my steps pursuing, naked though he be and reft of all, was of more high estate than thou believest. Grandchild of the chaste Gualdrada, him they Guidoguera called, who in his lifetime many a noble act achieved, both by his wisdom and his sword. The other, next to me that beats the sand, is Aldobrandi, name deserving well, in the upper world of honor. And myself, who in this torment do partake with them, am Rusticucci, whom past doubt my wife of savage temper, more than aught beside hath to this evil brought. If from the fire I had been sheltered, down amidst them straight I then had cast me, nor my guide, I deem, would have restrained my going. But that fear of the dire burning vanquished the desire, which made me eager of their wished embrace. I then began, not scorn, but grief much more, such as long time alone can cure, your doom fixed deep within me, soon as this my lord spake words, whose tenure taught me to expect that such a race as ye are was at hand. I am a countryman of yours, who still affectionate have uttered, and have heard your deeds and names renowned. Leaving the goal for the sweet fruit I go that a sure guide hath promised to me, but behooves that far as to the center first I downward tend. So may long space thy spirit guide thy limbs, he answer straight returned, and so thy fame shine bright when thou art gone, as thou shalt tell, if courtesy and valor as they won't, dwell in our city or have vanished clean. For one amidst us late condemned to wail, Borsier, yonder walking with his peers, grieves us no little by the news he brings. An upstart multitude and sudden gains, pride and excess, O Florence, have in thee engendered, so that now in tears thou mournst. Thus cried I with my face upraised, and they all three, who for an answer took my words, looked at each other, as men look when truth comes to their ear. If thou at other times, they all at once rejoined, so easily satisfy those who question, happy thou, gifted with words, so apt to speak thy thought. Wherefore, if thou escape this darksome climb, returning to behold the radiant stars, when thou with pleasure shalt retrace the past, see that of us thou speak among mankind. This said they broke the circle, and so swift fled, that as pinions seemed their nimble feet. Not in so short a time might one have said Amen, as they had vanished. Straight my guide pursued his track. I followed, and small space had we passed onward, when the water's sound was now so near at hand that we had scarce heard one another's speech for the loud din. E'en as the river, that holds on its course unmingled, from the Mount of Vesulo, on the left side of Apennine, toward the east, which Aquacheta higher up they call, ere it descend into the vale, at Forli by that name no longer known, Rebellos or St. Benedict, rolled on from the Alpine summit down a precipice, where space enough to lodge a thousand spreads. Thus downward from a craggy steep we found, that this dark wave resounded, roaring loud, so that the ear its clamor soon had stunned. I had a cord that braced my girdle round, wherewith I erst had thought fast bound to take the painted leopard. This when I had all unloosened from me, so my master bade, I gathered up, and stretched it forth to him. Then to the right he turned, and from the brink standing few paces distant, cast it down into the deep abyss. And somewhat strange, thus to myself I spake, signal so strange betokens, which my guide with earnest eye thus follows. Ah, what caution must men use with those who look not at the deed alone, but spy into the thoughts with subtle skill? Quickly shall come, he said, what I expect thine eye discover quickly, that whereof thy thought is dreaming. Ever to that truth, which but the semblance of a falsehood wears, 
a man, if possible, should bar his lip, since, although blameless, he incurs reproach. But silence here were vain, and by these notes which now I sing, reader, I swear to thee, so may they favor find to latest times, that through the gross and murky air I spied a shape come swimming up, that might have quelled the stoutest heart with wonder, in such guise as one returns, who hath been down to loose an anchor grappled fast against some rock, or to aught else that in the salt wave lies, who upward springing close draws in his feet. Canto 17 Lo, the fell monster with the deadly sting, who passes mountains, breaks through fenced walls and firm embattled spears, and with his filth taints all the world. Thus me my guide addressed, and beckoned him that he should come to shore, near to the stony causeway's utmost edge. Forthwith that image vile of fraud appeared, his head and upper part exposed on land, but laid not on the shore his bestial train. His face the semblance of a just man's war, so kind and gracious was its outward cheer. The rest was serpent all. Two shaggy claws reached to the armpits, and the back and breast, and either side were painted o'er with nodes and orbits. Colors variegated more, nor Turks nor Tartars air on cloth of state, with interchangeable embroidery wove, nor spread arachne o'er her curious loom. As oft times a light skiff, moored to the shore, stands part in water, part upon the land or, as where dwells the greedy German boar, the beaver settles watching for his prey. So on the rim that fenced the sand with rock sat perched the fiend of evil. In the void glancing, his tail upturned its venomous fork, with sting like scorpions armed. Then thus my guide, now need our way must turn few steps apart, far as to that ill beast who couches there. Thereat toward the right our downward course we shaped, and better to escape the flame and burning marl, ten paces on the verge, proceeded. Soon as we to him arrive, a little further on mine eye beholds a tribe of spirits, seated on the sand near the wide chasm. Forthwith my master spake, that to the full thy knowledge may extend of all this round contains, go now, and mark the mean these wear, but hold not long discourse, till thou returnest I with him meantime will parley, that to us he may vouchsafe the aid of his strong shoulders. Thus alone, yet forward on the extremity I paced of that seventh circle, where the mournful tribe were seated. At the eyes forth gushed their pangs. Against the vapors and the torrid soil, alternately their shifting hands they plied. Thus used the dogs in summer still to ply their jaws and feet by turns, when bitten sore by gnats or flies or gadflies swarming round, noting the visages of some who lay beneath the pelting of that dolorous fire, one of them all I knew not but perceived that pendant from his neck each bore a pouch with colors and with emblems various marked, on which it seemed as if their eye did feed. And when amongst them looking round I came, a yellow purse I saw with azure wrought, that wore a lion's countenance and port. Then still my sight pursuing its career, another I beheld, than blood more red, a goose display of whiter wing than curd, and one who bore a fat and azure swine pictured on his white scrip, addressed me thus. What dost thou in this deep? Go now and know, since yet thou livest, that my neighbor here Vitaliano on my left shall sit. A Paduan with these Florentines am I. Oft times they thunder in mine ears, exclaiming, O haste that noble knight, he who the pouch with the three beaks will bring. This said, he writhed the mouth, and lolled the tongue out like an ox that licks his nostrils. I, lest longer stay, he ill might brook, who bade me stay not long, backward my steps from those sad spirits turned. My guide already seated on the haunch of the fierce animal I found, and thus he me encouraged. Be thou stout, be bold, down such a steep flight must we now descend. Mount thou before, for that no power the tail may have to harm thee, I will be i' the midst. As one who hath an ague fit so near, his nails already are turned blue, and he quivers all o'er, if he but eye the shade. Such was my cheer at hearing of his words. But shame soon interposed her threat who makes the servant bold in presence of his lord. I settled me upon those shoulders huge, and would have said, but that the words to aid my purpose came not, look thou clasp me firm. But he whose succor then not first I proved, soon as I mounted in his arms aloft, embracing held me up, and thus he spake, Geryon, now move thee, be thy wheeling gyres of ample circuit, easy thy descent, think on the unusual burden thou sustain'st. 
as a small vessel backening out from land, her station quits. So thence the monster loosed, and when he felt himself at large turned round, there where the breast had been his forked tail. Thus like an eel, outstretched at length he steered, gathering the air up with retractile claws. Not greater was the dread when Phaeton, the reins let drop at random, whence high heaven whereof signs yet appear was wrapped in flames, nor when ill-fated Icarus perceived, by liquefaction of the scalded wax, the trusted pennons loosened from his loins, his sire exclaiming loud, Ill way thou keep'st. Then was my dread when round me on each part the air I viewed, and other object none save the fell beast. He slowly sailing, wheels his downward motion, unobserved of me, but that the wind arising to my face breathes on me from below. Now on our right I heard the cataract beneath us leap with hideous crash, whence bending down to explore, new terror I conceived at the steep plunge, for flames I saw and wailing smote mine ear, so that all trembling close I crouched my limbs, and then distinguished unperceived before by the dread torments that on every side drew nearer, how our downward course we wound. As falcon that hath long been on the wing, but lure nor bird hath seen, while in despair the falconer cries, Ah me, thou stoops to earth, wearied descends, and swiftly down the sky in many an orbit wheels, then lighting sits, at distance from his lord in angry mood. So Geryon lighting places us on foot low down at base of the deep furrowed rock, and of his burden there discharged, forthwith sprang forward, like an arrow from the string. Canto 18 There is a place within the depths of hell called Malabolge, all of rock dark stained with hue ferruginous, e'en as the steep that round its circling winds. Right in the midst of that abominable region yawns a spacious gulf profound, whereof the frame due time shall tell. The circle that remains, throughout its round, between the gulf and base of the high craggy banks, successive forms ten trenches, in its hollow bottom sunk. As where to guard the walls, full many a foss begird some stately castle, sure defence affording to the space within, so here were modelled these, and as like fortresses e'en from their threshold to the brink without, are flanked with bridges. From the rock's low base thus flinty paths advanced, that crossed the moles and dikes, struck onward far as to the gulf, that in one bound collected cuts them off. Such was the place wherein we found ourselves, from Geryon's back dislodged. The bard to left held on his way, and I behind him moved. On our right hand new misery I saw, new pains, new executioners of wrath, that swarming peopled the first chasm. Below were naked sinners. Hitherward they came, meeting our faces from the middle point, with us beyond, but with a larger stride. E'en thus the Romans, when the year returns of jubilee, with better speed to rid the thronging multitudes, their means devise for such as pass the bridge, that on one side all front toward the castle, and approach St. Peter's fane, on the other towards the mount. Each diver's way along the grisly rock, horned demons I beheld, with lashes huge, that on their back unmercifully smote. Ah, how they made them bound at the first stripe! None for the second waited nor the third. Meantime, as on I passed, one met my sight whom soon as viewed. Of him, cried I, not yet mine eye hath had his fill. With fixed gaze I therefore scanned him. Straight the teacher kind paused with me, and consented I should walk backward a space, and the tormented spirit, who thought to hide him, bent his visage down. But it availed him naught, for I exclaimed, Thou who dost cast thy eye upon the ground, unless thy features do belie thee much, Venetico art thou. But what brings thee into this bitter seasoning? He replied, Unwillingly I answer to thy words. But thy clear speech, that to my mind recalls the world I once inhabited, constrains me. Know then t'was I who led fair Gisola to do the Marquis' will, however fame the shameful tale have bruited. Nor alone Bologna hither sendeth me to mourn. Rather with us the place is so o'erthronged that not so many tongues this day are taught, betwixt the Reno and Savina's stream, to answer Sipa in their country's phrase. And if of that securer proof thou need, remember but our craving thirst for gold. Him speaking thus, a demon with his thongs struck, and exclaimed, Away, corrupter, here women are none for sale. Forthwith I joined my escort, and few paces thence we came to where a rock forth issued from the bank that easily ascended to the right upon its splinter turning, we depart from those eternal barriers. 
when arrived, where underneath the gaping arch lets pass the scourged souls. Pause here, the teacher said, and let these others miserable now strike on thy ken, faces not yet beheld, for that together they with us have walked. From the old bridge we eyed the pack who came from the other side towards us like the rest, excoriate from the lash. My gentle guide by me unquestioned, thus his speech resumed. Behold that lofty shade who this way tends, and seems too woe-begone to drop a tear, how yet the regal aspect he retains. Jason is he whose skill and prowess won the ram from Kolkos. To the Lemnian Isle his passage thither led him, when those bold and pitiless women had slain all their males. There he with tokens and fair witching words hypsipily beguiled, a virgin young, who first had all the rest herself beguiled. Impregnated he left her there forlorn, such as the guilt condemns him to this pain. Here, too, Medea's injuries are avenged. All bear him company, who like deceit to his have practiced. And thus much to know of the first veil suffice thee, and of those whom its keen torments urge. Now had we come where, crossing the next pier, the straightened path bestrides its shoulders to another arch. Hence in the second chasm we heard the ghosts, who gibber in low melancholy sounds, with wide-stretched nostrils snort, and on themselves smite with their palms. Upon the banks a scurf from the foul steam condensed, encrusting hung, that held sharp combat with the sight and smell. So hollow is the depth, that from no part, save on the summit of the rocky span, could I distinguish aught. Thus far we came, and thence I saw within the fosse below, a crowd immersed in ordure, that appeared draught of the human body. There beneath searching with eye inquisitive, I marked one with his head so grimmed, twere hard to deem, if he were clerk or layman. Loud he cried, Why greedily thus bendest more on me, than on these other filthy ones thy ken? Because if true my memory, I replied, I heretofore have seen thee with dry locks, and thou Alessio art of Luca sprung, therefore than all the rest I scan thee more. Then beating on his brain these words he spake, Me thus low down my flatteries have sunk, wherewith I ne'er enough could glut my tongue. My leader thus, a little further stretch thy face, that thou the visage well mayest note of that besotted sluttish courtesan, who there doth rend her with defiled nails, now crouching down, now risen on her feet. Thais is this, the harlot, whose false lip answered her doting paramour that asked, Thankest me much, say rather wondrously, and seeing this here satiate be our view. Canto 19. Woe to thee, Simon Magus! Woe to you, his wretched followers! Who the things of God which should be wedded unto goodness, them, rapacious as ye are, do prostitute for gold and silver in adultery. Now must the trumpet sound for you, since yours is the third chasm. Upon the following vault we now had mounted, where the rock impends directly o'er the center of the fosse. Wisdom supreme, how wonderful the art! which thou dost manifest in heaven, in earth, and in the evil world, how just a meed allotting by thy virtue unto all. I saw the livid stone throughout the sides and in its bottom full of apertures, all equal in their width and circular each, nor ample less nor larger they appeared than in St. John's fair dome of me beloved those framed to hold the pure baptismal streams, one of the which I break some few years past, to save a whelming infant and be this a seal to undeceive whoever doubts the motive of my deed. From out the mouth of every one emerged a sinner's feet, and of the legs high upward as the calf, the rest beneath was hid. On either foot the souls were burning, whence the flexile joints glanced with such violent motion as had snapped asunder cords or twisted widths. As flame, feeding on unctuous matter, glides along the surface, scarcely touching where it moves. So here, from heel to point, glided the flames. Master, say who is he, than all the rest glancing in fiercer agony, on whom a ruddier flame doth prey? I thus inquired, If thou be willing, he replied, that I carry thee down, where least the slope bank falls, he of himself shall tell thee and his wrongs. I then, as pleases thee to me is best. Thou art my lord, and know'st that ne'er I quit thy will. What silence hides that knowest thou? Thereat on the fourth pier we came, we turned, and on our left descended to the depth, a narrow strait and perforated close. Nor from his side my leader set me down, till to his orifice he brought, 
whose limb quivering expressed his pang. Whoe'er thou art, sad spirit, thus reversed, and as a stake driven in the soil. I in these words began, if thou be able, utter forth thy voice. There stood I like the friar, that doth shrive a wretch for murder doomed, who e'en when fixed, calleth him back, whence death a while delays. He shouted, Ha! Already standest there? Already standest there, O Boniface? By many a year the writing played me false. So early dost thou surfeit with the wealth, for which thou fearedst not in guile to take the lovely lady, and then mangle her. I felt as those who, piercing not the drift of answer made them, stand as if exposed in mockery, nor know what to reply, when Virgil thus admonished, Tell him quick, I am not he, not he, whom thou believest. And I, as was enjoined me, straight replied. That heard, the spirit all did wrench his feet, and sighing next in woeful accent spake, What then of me requirest? If to know so much imports thee who I am, that thou hast therefore down the bank descended, learn that in the mighty mantle I was robbed, and of a she-bear was indeed the son, so eager to advance my whelps, that there my having in my purse above I stowed, and here myself. Under my head are dragged the rest, my predecessors in the guilt of simony. Stretched at their length they lie along an opening in the rock. Midst them I also low shall fall, soon as he comes, for whom I took thee, when so hastily I questioned. But already longer time hath passed, since my soul's kindled, and I thus upturned have stood, than is his doom to stand planted with fiery feet. For after him one yet of deeds more ugly shall arrive, from forth the west, a shepherd without law, fated to cover both his form and mine. He a new Jason shall be called, of whom in Maccabees we read, and favor such as to that priest his king indulgent showed, shall be of France's monarch shown to him. I know not if I hear too far presumed, but in this strain I answered, Tell me now, what treasures from St. Peter at the first our Lord demanded, when he put the keys into his charge? Surely he asked no more, but follow me nor Peter nor the rest or gold or silver of Matthias took, when lots were cast upon the forfeit place of the condemned soul. Abide thou then, thy punishment of right is merited, and look thou well to that ill-gotten coin which against Charles thy hardihood inspired. If reverence of the keys restrained me not, which thou in happier time didst hold, I yet severer speech might use. Your avarice o'ercast the world with mourning, underfoot treading the good and raising bad men up. Of shepherds like to you the evangelist was ware, when her who sits upon the waves with kings in filthy whoredom he beheld, she who with seven heads towered at her birth, and from ten horns her proof of glory drew, long as her spouse in virtue took delight. Of gold and silver ye have made your god, differing wherein from the idolater, but he that worships one, a hundred ye. Ah, Constantine, to how much ill gave birth! not thy conversion, but that plenteous dower which the first wealthy father gained from thee. Meanwhile, as thus I sung, he, whether wrath or conscience smote him, violent upsprang spinning on either soul. I do believe my teacher well was pleased. With so composed a lip, he listened ever to the sound of the true words I uttered. In both arms he caught, and to his bosom lifting me upward retraced the way of his descent. Nor weary of his weight he pressed me close till to the summit of the rock we came, our passage from the fourth to the fifth pier. His cherished burden there gently he placed upon the rugged rock and steep, a path not easy for the clambering goat to mount. Thence to my view another veil appeared, Canto twenty. And now the verse proceeds to torments new, fit argument of this the twentieth strain of the first song, whose awful theme records the spirits whelmed in woe. Earnest I looked into the depth that opened to my view, moistened with tears of anguish, and beheld a tribe that came along the hollow vale, in silence weeping, such their step as walk choirs chanting solemn litanies on earth. As on them more direct mine eye descends, each wondrously seemed to be reversed at the neckbone, so that the countenance was from the reins averted, and because none might before him look, they were compelled to advance with backward gait. Thus one perhaps hath been by force of palsy clean transposed, but I ne'er saw it nor believe it so. Now, reader, think within thyself so God fruit of thy reading give thee, how I long could keep my visage dry when I beheld near me our form distorted in such guise, 
that on the hinder parts fallen from the face the tears downstreaming rolled. Against a rock I leant and wept, so that my guide exclaimed, What, and art thou too witless as the rest? Here pity most doth show herself alive when she is dead. What guilt exceedeth his, who with heaven's judgment in his passion strives? Raise up thy head, raise up and see the man, before whose eyes earth gaped in Thebes, when all cried out, Amphiaraeus, whither rushest? Why leavest thou the war? He not the less fell ruining far as to Minos down, whose grapple none eludes. Lo, how he makes the breast his shoulders, and who once too far before him wished to see, now backward looks, and treads reverse his path. Tiresias note, whose semblance changed, when woman he became of male, through every limb transformed, and then once more behoved him with his rod to strike the two entwining serpents, ere the plumes that marked the better sex might shoot again. Aruns, with more his belly facing, comes. On Luni's mountains midst the marbles white, where delves Carrara's hind, who ones beneath, a cavern was his dwelling, whence the stars and main sea wide in boundless view he held. The next, whose loosened tresses overspread her bosom, which thou seest not, for each hair on that side grows, was Manto, she who searched through many regions, and at length her seat fixed in my native land, whence a short space my words detain thy audience. When her sire from life departed, and in servitude the city dedicate to Bacchus mourned, long time she went a wanderer through the world. Aloft in Italy's delightful land a lake there lies at foot of that proud Alp, that o'er the Tyrol locks Germania in, its name Benicus, which a thousand rills, methinks, and more, water between the vale Camonica and Garda, and the height of Apennine remote. There is a spot at midway of that lake, where he who bears of Trento's flock the pastoral staff, with him of Brescia and the Veronese, might each passing that way his benediction give. A garrison of goodly sight and strong Peschiera stands, to awe with front opposed the Burgamese and Brescian, whence the shore more slope each way descends. There whatsoever Benicus's bosom holds not, tumbling o'er down falls, and winds a river flood beneath through the green pastures. Soon as in his course the steam makes head, Benicus then no more. They call the name but Mincius, till at last reaching Governo into Po he falls. Not far his course hath run, when a wide flat it finds, which overstretching as a marsh, it covers, pestilent in summer oft. Hence journeying the savage maiden saw midst of the fen a territory waste and naked of inhabitants. To shun all human converse, here she with her slaves plying her arts remained and lived, and left her body tenantless. Thenceforth the tribes who round were scattered, gathering to that place assembled, for its strength was great, enclosed on all parts by the fen. On those dead bones they reared themselves a city for her sake, calling it Mantua, who first chose the spot, nor asked another omen for the name, wherein more numerous the people dwelt, ere Casalodi's madness by deceit was wronged of Pinamonte. If thou hear henceforth another origin assigned of that my country, I forewarn thee now, that falsehood none beguile thee of the truth. I answered, Teacher, I conclude thy words so certain that all else shall be to me as embers lacking life. But now of these who here proceed instruct me, if thou see any that merit more especial note. For thereon is my mind alone intent. He straight replied, That spirit from whose cheek the beard sweeps o'er his shoulders brown, what time Gratia was emptied of her males, that scarce the cradles were supplied, the seer was he in Aulis, who with Calchas gave the sign when first to cut the cable. Him they named Eurypylus, so sings my tragic strain, in which majestic measure well thou knowest, who knowest it all. That other, round the loins so slender of his shape, was Michael Scott, practised in every sleight of magic while. Guido Bonatti see, as Dente Mark, who now were willing, he had tended still the thread and cordwain, and too late repents. See next the wretches who the needle left, the shuttle and the spindle, and became diviners, baneful witcheries they wrought with images and herbs. But onward now, for now doth Cain with fork of thorns confine on either hemisphere, touching the wave beneath the towers of Seville. Yesternight the moon was round, thou mayest remember well, for she good service did thee in the gloom of the deep wood. This said, both onward moved. Canto 21. Thus we from bridge to bridge with other talk, 
the which my drama cares not to rehearse, passed on, and to the summit reaching stood to view another gap, within the round of Malabolge, other bootless pangs. Marvelous darkness shadowed o'er the place, in the Venetian's arsenal as boils through wintry months' tenacious pitch to smear their unsound vessels, for the inclement time seafaring men restrains, and in that while his bark one builds anew, another stops the ribs of his, that hath made many a voyage, one hammers at the prow, one at the poop, this shapeth oars, that other cables twirls, the mizzen one repairs and mainsail rent, so not by force of fire but art divine, boiled here a glutinous thick mass, that round limbed all the shore beneath. I that beheld, but therein naught distinguished, save the surge, raised by the boiling, in one mighty swell heave, and by turns subsiding and fall. While there I fixed my ken below, Mark, Mark, my guide exclaiming, drew me towards him from the place wherein I stood. I turned myself as one, impatient to behold that which beheld he needs must shun, whom sudden fear unmans, that he his flight delays not for the view. Behind me I discerned a devil black, that running up advanced along the rock. Ah, what fierce cruelty his look bespake! In act how bitter did he seem, with wings buoyant outstretched and feet of nimblest tread! His shoulder proudly eminent and sharp was with a sinner charged. By either haunch he held him, the foot sinew griping fast. Ye of our bridge, he cried, keen taloned fiends! Lo, one of Santa Zita's elders! Him whelm ye beneath, while I return for more. That land hath store of such. All men are there, except Bonturo, barterers. Of no for lucre there an eye is quickly made. Him dashing down, o'er the rough rock he turned, nor ever after thief a mastiff loosed, sped with like eager haste. That other sank, and forthwith writhing to the surface rose. But those dark demons, shrouded by the bridge, cried, Here the hallowed visage saves not. Here is other swimming than in Circio's wave. Wherefore, if thou desire, we rend thee not. Take heed, thou mount not o'er the pitch. This said, they grappled him with more than hundred hooks, and shouted, Covered thou must sport thee here, so if thou canst, in secret mayst thou filch. E'en thus the cook bestirs him with his grooms, to thrust the flesh into the cauldron down with flesh hooks, that it float not on the top. Me then my guide bespake, lest they descry that thou art here behind a craggy rock bend low and screen thee, and what air of force be offered me or insult fear thou not, for I am well advised who have been erst in the like fray. Beyond the bridge's head therewith he passed, and reaching the sixth pier behoved him then a forehead terror-proof. With storm and fury, as when dogs rush forth upon the poor man's back, who suddenly from whence he standeth makes his suit, so rushed those from beneath the arch, and against him their weapons all they pointed. He allowed, Be none of you outrageous, ere your time dare seize me, come forth from amongst you one, who, having heard my words, decide he then, if he shall tear these limbs. They shouted loud, Go, Malakoda! Whereat one advanced, the other standing firm, and as he came, What may this turn avail him? he exclaimed. Believest thou, Malakoda? I had come thus far from all your skirmishing secure, my teacher answered, without will divine and destiny propitious. Pass we then, for so heaven's pleasure is, that I should lead another through this savage wilderness. Forthwith so fell his pride, that he let drop the instrument of torture at his feet, and to the rest exclaimed, We have no power to strike him. Then to me my guide, O thou, who on the bridge among the crags dost sit low crouching, safely now to me return. I rose and towards him moved with speed. The fiends meantime all forward drew, me terror seized lest they should break the compact they had made. Thus issuing from Caprona, once I saw the infantry dreading, lest his covenant the foe should break, so close he hemmed them round. I to my leader's side adhered, mine eyes with fixed and motionless observance bent on their unkindly visage. They their hooks protruding, one the other thus bespake, Wilt thou I touch him on the hip? To whom was answered, Even so, nor miss thy aim. But he who was in conference with my guide turned rapid round, and thus the demon spake, Stay, stay thee, Scarmiglione. Then to us he added, Further footing to your step this rock affords not, shivered to the base of the sixth arch. But would you still proceed, up by this cavern go. Not distant far, another rock will yield you passage safe. Yesterday, later by five hours than now, 
twelve hundred threescore years and six had filled the circuit of their course, since here the way was broken. Thitherward I straight dispatch certain of these my scouts, who shall espy if any on the surface bask. With them go ye, for ye shall find them nothing fell. Come Alicino forth. With that he cried, And Calcabrina and Cagnazzo thou, the troop of ten let Barbariccia lead. With Libicoco Draganazzo haste, fanged Siriato, Graflacane fierce and Farfarello, and mad Rubicant, search ye around the bubbling tar. For these in safety lead them, where the other crag uninterrupted traverses the dens. I then, O oh, master, what a sight is there! Ah, without escort journey we alone, which, if thou know the way, I covet not. Unless thy prudence fail thee, dost not mark how they do gnarl upon us, and their scowl threatens us present tortures. He replied, I charge thee, fear not. Let them, as they will, gnarl on, tis but in token of their spite against the souls, who mourn in torment steeped. To leftward o'er the pier they turned, but each had first between his teeth pressed close the tongue, toward their leader for a signal looking, which he with sound obscene triumphant gave. Canto 22 It hath been heretofore my chance to see horsemen with martial order shifting camp, to onset sallying, or in muster ranged, or in retreat sometimes outstretched for flight. Light-armed squadrons and fleet foragers scouring thy plains, Arezzo, have I seen, and clashing tournaments and tilting jousts, now with the sound of trumpets, now of bells, tabors or signals made from castled heights, and with inventions multiform our own, or introduced from foreign land. But ne'er to such a strange recorder I beheld, in evolution moving horse nor foot, nor ship that tacked by sign from land or star. With the ten demons on our way we went, ah, fearful company, but in the church with saints, with gluttons at the tavern's mess. Still earnest on the pitch I gazed, to mark all things whate'er the chasm contained, and those who burned within. As dolphins that in sign to mariners heave high their arched backs, that thence forewarned they may advise to save their threatened vessels, so at intervals, to ease the pain his back some sinner showed, then hid more nimbly than the lightning glance. E'en as the frogs that of a watery moat stand at the brink, with the jaws only out, their feet and of the trunk all else concealed, thus on each part the sinners stood. But soon as Barbaricia was at hand, so they drew back under the wave. I saw, and yet my heart doth stagger one that waited thus, as it befalls that oft one frog remains, while the next springs away. And Graphiacan, who of the fiends was nearest, grappling seized his clotted locks and dragged him sprawling up, that he appeared to me an otter, each already by their names I knew, so well when they were chosen I observed, and marked how one the other called. O Rubicant, see that his hide thou with thy talons flay, shouted together all the cursed crew. Then I, inform thee, master, if thou may, what wretched soul is this on whom their hand his foes have laid? My leader to his side approached, and whence he came inquired, to whom was answered thus. Born in Navarre's domain, my mother placed me in a lord's retinue, for she had borne me to a losel vile, a spendthrift of his substance and himself. The good king Thebolt after that I served, to peculating here my thoughts were turned, whereof I give account in this dire heat. Straight Ciriato, from whose mouth a tusk issued on either side, as from a boar, ripped him with one of these. Twixt evil claws the mouse had fallen, but Barbariccia cried, seizing him with both arms, Stand thou apart, while I do fix him on my prong transpierced. Then added, turning to my guide his face, Inquire of him, if more thou wish to learn, ere he again be rent. My leader thus, Then tell us of the partners in thy guilt. Knowest thou any sprung of Latian land under the tar? I parted, he replied, but now from one who sojourned not far thence. So were I under shelter now with him, nor hook nor talon then should scare me more. Too long we suffer, Libicoco cried, then darting forth a prong seized on his arm, and mangled bore away the sinewy part. Him Draganazzo by his thighs beneath would next have caught, whence angrily their chief, turning on all sides round with threatening brow, restrained them. When their strife a little ceased, of him, who yet was gazing on his wound, my teacher thus without delay inquired, Who was the spirit, from whom by evil hap parting, as thou hast told, thou camest to shore? It was the friar Gomita, he rejoined, 
he of Galura, vessel of all guile, who had his master's enemies in hand, and used them so that they commend him well. Money he took, and them at large dismissed, so he reports, and in each other charge committed to his keeping, played the part of barterer to the height. With him doth herd the chief of Logodoro, Mikkel Zanchi. Sardinia is a theme, whereof their tongue is never weary. Out, alas, behold that other how he grins. More would I say, but tremble lest he mean to maul me sore. Their captain then to Farfarello turning, who rolled his moony eyes in act to strike, rebuked him thus. Off, cursed bird, avaunt. If ye desire to see or hear, he thus quaking with dread resumed, or Tuscan spirits or Lombard, I will cause them to appear. Meantime let these ill talons bait their fury, so that no vengeance they may fear from them, and I, remaining in this selfsame place, will for myself but one, make seven appear, when my shrill whistle shall be heard, for so our custom is to call each other up. Cagnazzo at that word deriding grinned, then wagged the head and spake, Hear his device, mischievous as he is, to plunge him down. Whereto he thus, who failed not in rich store of nice wove toils, mischief forsooth extreme, meant only to procure myself more woe. No longer Alicino then refrained, but thus the rest gainsaying him bespake, If thou do cast thee down, I not on foot will chase thee, but above the pitch will beat my plumes. Quit we the vantage ground, and let the bank be as a shield that we may see if singly thou prevail against us all. Now, reader, of new sport expect to hear. They each one turned his eyes to the other shore, he first, who was the hardest to persuade. The spirit of Navarre chose well his time, planted his feet on land, and at one leap escaping disappointed their resolve. Them quick resentment stung, but him the most, who was the cause of failure. In pursuit he therefore sped, exclaiming, Thou art caught! But little it availed. Terror outstripped his following flight. The other plunged beneath, and he with upward pinion raised his breast. E'en thus the waterfowl, when she perceives the falcon near, dives instant down while he enraged and spent retires. That mockery in Calcabrina fury stirred, who flew after him with desire of strife inflamed, and for the barterer had scaped, so turned his talons on his comrade. O'er the dike in grapple close they joined but the other proved a goshawk able to rend well his foe, and in the boiling lake both fell. The heat was umpire soon between them, but in vain to lift themselves they strove, so fast were glued their pennons. Barbariccia as the rest, that chance lamenting, four in flight dispatched from the other coast, with all their weapons armed, they to their post on each side speedily descending, stretched their hooks toward the fiends, who floundered, inly burning from their scars, and we departing left them to that broil. Canto 23 In silence and in solitude we went, one first, the other following his steps, as minor friars journeying on their road. The present fray had turned my thoughts to muse upon old Aesop's fable, where he told what fate unto the mouse and frog befell. For language hath not sounds more like incense than are these chances, if the origin and end of each be heedfully compared. And as one thought bursts from another forth, so afterward from that another sprang, which added doubly to my former fear. For thus I reasoned, these through us have been so foiled, with loss and mockery so complete, as needs must sting them sore. If anger then be to their evil will conjoined, more fell they shall pursue us than the savage hound snatches the leveret, panting twixt his jaws. Already I perceived my hair stand all on end with terror, and looked eager back. Teacher, I thus began, if speedily thyself and me thou hide not, much I dread those evil talons. Even now behind they urge us. Quick imagination works so forcibly that I already feel them. He answered, Were I formed of leaded glass, I should not sooner draw unto myself thy outward image than I now imprint that from within. This moment came thy thoughts presented before mine, with similar act, and countenance similar, so that from both I one design have framed. If the right coast incline so much, that we may thence descend into the other chasm, we shall escape secure from this imagined pursuit. He had not spoke his purpose to the end, when I from far beheld them with spread wings approach to take us. Suddenly my guide caught me, even as a mother that from sleep is by the noise aroused, and near her sees the climbing fires,
who snatches up her babe and flies near pausing, careful more of him than of herself, that but a single vest clings round her limbs. Down from the jutting beach supine he cast him, to that pendant rock, which closes on one part the other chasm. Never ran water with such hurrying pace. Adown the tube to turn a landmill's wheel, when nearest it approaches to the spokes, as then along that edge my master ran, carrying me in his bosom as a child, not a companion. Scarcely had his feet reached to the lowest of the bed beneath, when over us the steep they reached, but fear in him was none, for that high providence which placed them ministers of the fifth foss, power of departing thence took from them all. There in the depth we saw a painted tribe, who paced with tardy steps around and wept, faint in appearance and o'ercome with toil. Caps had they on with hoods that fell low down before their eyes, in fashion like to those worn by the monks in Cologne. Their outside was overlaid with gold, dazzling to view, but leaden all within, and of such weight that Fredericks compared to these were straw. O oh, everlasting wearisome attire! We yet once more with them together turned to leftward, on their dismal moan intent. But by the weight oppressed, so slowly came the fainting people, that our company was changed at every movement of the step, whence I my guide addressed. See that thou find some spirit, whose name may by his deeds be known, and to that end look round thee as thou goest. Then one who understood the Tuscan voice, cried after us aloud, Hold in your feet, ye who so swiftly speed through the dusk air. Perchance from me thou shalt obtain thy wish. Whereat my leader turning me bespake, Pause, and then onward at their pace proceed. I stayed, and saw two spirits in whose look impatient eagerness of mind was marked to overtake me, but the load they bear and narrow path retarded their approach. Soon as arrived, they with an eye askance perused me but spake not. Then turning each to other thus conferring said, This one seems by the action of his throat alive, and be they dead, what privilege allows they walk unmantled by the cumbrous stole. Then thus to me, Tuscan who visitest the college of the morning hypocrites, disdain not to instruct us who thou art. By Arno's pleasant stream, I thus replied, in the great city I was bred and grew, and wear the body I have ever worn. But who are ye, from whom such mighty grief, as now I witness, courseth down your cheeks? What torment breaks forth in this bitter woe? Our bonnets gleaming bright with orange hue, one of them answered, are so leaden gross, that with their weight they make the balances to crack beneath them. Joyous friars we were, Bologna's natives, Catalano thirst, he Lodoringo namned, and by thy land together taken, as men used to take a single and indifferent arbiter, to reconcile their strifes. How there we sped, Gardingo's vicinage can best declare. O oh, friars, I began, your miseries. But there break off, for one had caught my eye, fixed to a cross with three stakes on the ground. He, when he saw me, writhed himself throughout distorted, ruffling with deep sighs his beard. And Catalano, who thereof was where, thus spake, That pierced spirit whom intent thou viewst, was he who gave the Pharisees counsel, that it were fitting for one man to suffer for the people. He doth lie transverse, nor any passes, but him first behoves make feeling trial how each weighs. In straits like this along the foss are placed the father of his consort, and the rest partakers in that council, seed of ill and sorrow to the Jews. I noted then how Virgil gazed with wonder upon him, thus abjectly extended on the cross in banishment eternal. To the friar he next his words addressed, We pray ye tell, if so be lawful, whether on our right lies any opening in the rock, whereby we both may issue hence, without constraint on the dark angels, that compelled they come to lead us from this depth. He thus replied, Nearer than thou dost hope, there is a rock from the next circle moving, which o'ersteps each veil of horror, save that here his cope is shattered. By the ruin ye may mount, for on the side it slants, and most the height rises below. With head bent down a while my leader stood, then spake. He warned us ill, who yonder hangs the sinners on his hook, to whom the friar, at Bologna erst I many vices of the devil heard, among the rest was said, he is a liar, and the father of lies. When he had spoke, my leader with large strides proceeded on, somewhat disturbed with anger in his look. I therefore left the spirits heavy laden, and following, 
his beloved footsteps marked. Canto 24. In the year's early nonage, when the sun tempers his tresses in Aquarius's urn, and now towards equal day the nights recede, when as the rhyme upon the earth puts on her dazzling sister's image, but not long her milder sway endures, then riseth up the village hind, whom fails his wintry store, and looking out beholds the plain around all whitened, whence impatiently he smites his thighs, and to his hut returning in, their paces to and fro wailing his lot, as a discomfited and helpless man. Then comes he forth again, and feels new hope spring in his bosom, finding e'en thus soon the world hath changed its countenance, grasps his crook, and forth to pasture drives his little flock. So me my guide disheartened when I saw his troubled forehead, and so speedily that ill was cured. For at the fallen bridge arriving towards me with a look as sweet, he turned him back, as that I first beheld at the steep mountain's foot. Regarding well the ruin, and some counsel first maintained with his own thought, he opened wide his arm and took me up, as one who, while he works, computes his labor's issue, that he seems still to foresee the effect, so lifting me up to the summit of one peak, he fixed his eye upon another. Grapple that, said he, but first make proof, if it be such as will sustain thee. For one capped with lead this were no journey. Scarcely he, though light, and I, though onward pushed from crag to crag, could mount. And if the precinct of this coast were not less ample than the last, for him I know not, but my strength had surely failed, but malibulge all toward the mouth. Inclining of the nethermost abyss, the sight of every valley hence requires, that one side upward slope, the other fall. At length the point of our descent we reached from the last flag. Soon as to that arrived, so was the breath exhausted from my lungs I could no further but did seat me there. Now needs thy best of man, so spake my guide, for not on downy plumes nor under shade of canopy reposing, fame is won, without which whosoe'er consumes his days leaveth such vestige of himself on earth, as smoke in air or foam upon the wave. Thou therefore rise, vanish thy weariness by the mind's effort, in each struggle form to vanquish, if she suffer not the weight of her corporeal frame to crush her down. A longer ladder yet remains to scale, from these to have escaped sufficeth not. If well thou note me, profit by my words. I straightway rose and showed myself less spent than I in truth did feel me. On, I cried, for I am stout and fearless. Up the rock our way we held more rugged than before, narrower and steeper far to climb. From talk I ceased not as we journeyed so to seem least faint, whereat a voice from the other foss did issue forth, for utterance suited ill. Though on the arch that crosses there I stood, what were the words I knew not, but who spake seemed moved in anger. Down I stooped to look, but my quick eye might reach not to the depth for shrouding darkness. Wherefore thus I spake. To the next circle, teacher, bend thy steps, and from the wall dismount we, for as hence I hear and understand not, so I see beneath, and not discern. I answer not, said he, but by the deed. To fair request, silent performance maketh best return. We from the bridge's head descended, where to the eighth mound it joins, and then the chasm opening to view, I saw a crowd within. Of serpents terrible, so strange of shape and hideous, that remembrance in my veins yet shrinks the vital current. Of her sands let Libya vaunt no more. If Jaculus, Piraeus, and Chelider be her brood, Sencris and Amphisbena, plagues so dire, or in such numbers swarming ne'er she showed, not with all Ethiopia, and what e'er above the Erythrean sea is spawned. Amid this dread exuberance of woe ran naked spirits winged with horrid fear, nor hope had they of crevice where to hide, or heliotrope to charm them out of view. With serpents were their hands behind them bound, which through their reins infixed the tail and head twisted in folds before. And lo, on one near to our side darted an adder up, and where the neck is on the shoulders tied, transpierced him. Far more quickly than e'er pen wrote O or I, he kindled, burned, and changed to ashes, all poured out upon the earth. When there dissolved he lay, the dust again uprolled spontaneous, and the self-same form instant resumed. So mighty sages tell, the Arabian phoenix, when five hundred years have well nigh circled, dies and springs forthwith renascent. Blade nor herb throughout his life he tastes, but tears of frankincense alone and odorous amomum, swathes of nard and myrrh his funeral shroud. 
as one that falls he knows not how, by force demoniac dragged to earth, or through obstruction fettering up in chains invisible the powers of man, who risen from his trance gazeth around, bewildered with the monstrous agony he hath endured, and wildly staring sighs. So stood aghast the sinner when he rose. Oh, how severe God's judgment that deals out such blows in stormy vengeance! Who he was, my teacher next inquired, and thus in few he answered, Vani Fucci am I called, not long since rained down from Tuscany to this dire gullet. Me the bestial life and not the human pleased, mule that I was, who in Pistoia found my worthy den. I then to Virgil, bid him stir not hence, and ask what crime did thrust him hither. Once a man I knew him choleric and bloody. The sinner heard and feigned not, but towards me his mind directing and his face, wherein was dismal shame depictured, thus he spake. It grieves me more to have been caught by thee in this sad plight, which thou beholdest, than when I was taken from the other life. I have no power permitted to deny what thou inquirest. I am doomed thus low to dwell, for that the sacristy by me was rifled of its goodly ornaments, and with the guilt another falsely charged, but that thou mayest not joy to see me thus, so as thou e'er shalt scape this darksome realm, open thine ears and hear what I forebode. Reft of the nary first Pistoia pines, then Florence changeth citizens and laws. From Valdimagra, drawn by wrathful Mars, a vapour rises wrapped in turbid mists, and sharp and eager driveth on the storm with arrowy hurtling o'er Piceno's field, when suddenly the cloud shall burst, and strike each helpless Bianco prostrate to the ground. This have I told, that grief may rend thy heart. Canto 25 When he had spoke, the sinner raised his hands, pointed in mockery, and cried, Take them, God, I level them at thee. From that day forth the serpents were my friends, for round his neck one of them rolling twisted as it said, Be silent, tongue. Another to his arms upgliding, tied them, riveting itself so close, it took from them the power to move. Pistoia, ah, Pistoia, why dost doubt to turn thee into ashes, cumbering earth no longer, since in evil act so far thou hast outdone thy seed? I did not mark, through all the gloomy circles of the abyss, spirit, that swelled so proudly against his god, not him, who headlong fell from Thebes. He fled, nor uttered more, and after him there came a centaur full of fury, shouting, Where, where is the caitiff? On Maremma's marsh swarm, not the serpent tribe, as on his haunch they swarmed, to where the human face begins. Behind his head upon the shoulders lay, with open wings, a dragon breathing fire on whomsoe'er he met. To me, my guide, Cacus is this, who underneath the rock of Aventine spread oft a lake of blood. He from his brethren parted, here must tread a different journey, for his fraudful theft of the great herd, that near him stalled. Whence found his felon deeds their end, beneath the mace of stout Alcides, that perchance laid on a hundred blows, and not the tenth was felt. While yet he spake, the centaur sped away, and under us three spirits came, of whom nor I nor he was ware, till they exclaimed, Say, who are ye? We then break off discourse, intent on these alone. I knew them not, but as it chanceth oft befell, that one had need to name another. Where, said he, doth Kianfa lurk? I, for a sign my guide should stand attentive, placed against my lips, the finger lifted. If, O oh reader, now thou be not apt to credit what I tell, no marvel, for myself to scarce allow the witness of mine eyes. But as I look toward them, lo, a serpent with six feet springs forth on one, and fastens full upon him. His midmost grasped the belly, a forefoot seized on each arm, while deep in either cheek he fleshed his fangs. The hinder on the thighs were spread, twixt which the tail inserted curled upon the reins behind. Ivy ne'er clasped a doddered oak, as round the other's limbs the hideous monster intertwined his own. Then as they both had been of burning wax, each melted into other, mingling hues, that which was either now was seen no more. Thus up the shrinking paper, ere it burns, a brown tint glides, not turning yet to black and the clean white expires. The other two looked on, exclaiming, Ah, how dost thou change, Agnello? See, thou art nor double now, nor only one. The two heads now became one, and two figures blended in one form appeared, where both were lost. Of the four lengths two arms were made, 
the belly and the chest, the thighs and legs into such members changed, as never eye hath seen. Of former shape all trace was vanished, too yet neither seemed that image miscreate, and so passed on with tardy steps. As underneath the scourge of the fierce dog-star, that lays bare the fields, shifting from break to break, the lizard seems a flash of lightning, if he thwart the road, so toward the entrails of the other two approaching seemed an adder all on fire, as the dark pepper grain livid and swart. In that part, whence our life is nourished first, one he transpierced, then down before him fell stretched out. The pierced spirit looked on him but spake not, yea, stood motionless and yawned, as if by sleep or feverous fit assailed. He eyed the serpent and the serpent him, one from the wound, the other from the mouth breathed a thick smoke, whose vapory columns joined. Lucan in mute attention now may hear, nor thy disastrous fate, Sabellus, tell nor shine, Nasidius. Ovid now be mute. What if in warbling fiction he record Cadmus and Arethusa, to a snake him changed, and her into a fountain clear I envy not? For never face to face two natures thus transmuted did he sing, wherein both shapes were ready to assume the other's substance. They in mutual guise so answered, that the serpent split his train divided to a fork, and the pierced spirit drew close his steps together, legs and thighs compacted, that no sign of juncture soon was visible. The tail disparted took the figure which the spirit lost, its skin softening, his indurated to a rind. The shoulders next I marked, that entering joined the monster's armpits, whose two shorter feet so lengthened, as the other's dwindling shrunk. The feet behind then twisting up became, that part that man conceals, which in the wretch was cleft in twain. While both the shadowy smoke with a new color veils, and generates the excrescent pile on one, peeling it off from the other body, lo, upon his feet one upright rose, and prone the other fell. Not yet their glaring and malignant lamps were shifted, though each feature changed beneath. Of him who stood erect, the mounting face retreated towards the temples, and what their superfluous matter came, shot out in ears from the smooth cheeks, the rest, not backward dragged, of its excess did shape the nose, and swelled into due size protuberant the lips. He on the earth who lay, meanwhile extends his sharpened visage, and draws down the ears into the head, as doth the slug his horns. His tongue continuous before and apt for utterance severs, and the other's fork closing unites. That done the smoke was laid. The soul transformed into the brute glides off, hissing along the veil, and after him the other talking sputters, but soon turned his new-grown shoulders on him, and in few thus to another spake, Along this path crawling as I have done, speed Buoso now. So saw I fluctuate in successive change the unsteady ballast of the seventh hold, and here if aught my tongue have swerved, events so strange may be its warrant. O'er mine eyes confusion hung, and on my thoughts amaze. Yet scaped they not so covertly, but well I marked Siancato. He alone it was of the three first that came who changed not. Thou, the other's fate, Gavil, still dost rue. Canto 26. Florence exult, for thou so mightily hast thriven, that o'er land and sea thy wings thou beatest, and thy name spreads over hell. Among the plunderers such the three I found thy citizens, whence shame to me thy son, and no proud honor to thyself redounds. But if our minds, when dreaming near the dawn, are of the truth presageful, thou ere long shalt feel what Prato, not to say the rest, would fain might come upon thee, and that chance were in good time, if it befell thee now. Would so it were, since it must needs befall, for as time wears me I shall grieve the more. We from the depth departed, and my guide remounting scaled the flinty steps, which late we downward traced, and drew me up the steep. Pursuing thus our solitary way among the crags and splinters of the rock, sped not our feet without the help of hands. Then sorrow seized me, which e'en now revives, as my thought turns again to what I saw, and more than I am wont, I rein and curb the powers of nature in me, lest they run where virtue guides not, that if aught of good my gentle star, or something better gave me, I envy not myself the precious boon. As in that season when the sun least veils his face that lightens all, what time the fly gives way to the shrill gnat, the peasant then upon some cliff reclined, beneath him sees fireflies innumerous spangling o'er the veil, vineyard or tilth, where his day-labor lies, 
with flames so numberless throughout its space, shone the eighth chasm, apparent, when the depth was to my view exposed. As he whose wrongs the bears avenged, at its departure saw Elijah's chariot, when the steeds erect raised their steep flight for heaven. His eyes meanwhile straining pursued them, till the flame alone upsoaring like a misty speck he kenned. E'en thus along the gulf moves every flame, a sinner so enfolded close in each, that none exhibits token of the theft. Upon the bridge I forward bent to look, and grasped a flinty mass, or else had fallen, though pushed not from the height. The guide who marked how I did gaze attentive, thus began, Within these ardors are the spirits, each swathed in confining fire. Master, thy word, I answered, hath assured me, yet I deemed already of the truth, already wished to ask thee who is in yon fire, that comes so parted at the summit, as it seemed ascending from that funeral pile, where lay the Theban brothers. He replied, Within Ulysses there and Diomede endure their penal tortures, thus to vengeance now together hasting, as erewhile to wrath. These in the flame with ceaseless groans deplore the ambush of the horse, that opened wide a portal for that goodly seed to pass, which sowed imperial Rome, nor less the guile lament they, whence of her Achilles reft Didamia yet in death complains, and there is rude the stratagem, that Troy of her palladium spoiled. If they have power of utterance from within these sparks, said I, O master, think my prayer a thousandfold in repetition urged, that thou vouchsafe to pause till here the horned flame arrive. See how toward it with desire I bend. He thus, thy prayer is worthy of much praise, and I accept it therefore. But do thou thy tongue refrain, to question them be mine, for I divine thy wish, and they perchance, for they were Greeks, might shun discourse with thee. When there the flame had come, where time and place seemed fitting to my guide, he thus began. O ye who dwell two spirits in one fire, if living eye of you did merit aught, whate'er the measure were of that desert, when in the world my lofty strain I poured, move ye not on, till one of you unfold in what clime death o'ertook himself destroyed. Of the old flame forthwith the greater horn began to roll, murmuring as a fire that labors with the wind, then to and fro wagging the top as a tongue uttering sounds, threw out its voice and spake. When I escaped from Circe, who beyond a circling year had held me near Caeta, by her charms, ere thus Aeneas yet had named the shore, nor fondness for my son, nor reverence of my old father, nor return of love, that should have crowned Penelope with joy, could overcome in me the zeal I had to explore the world and search the ways of life, man's evil and his virtue. Forth I sailed into the deep illimitable main, with but one bark, and the small faithful band that yet cleaved to me. As Iberia far, far as Morocco either shore I saw, and the Sardinian and each isle beside which round that ocean bathes, tardy with age were I and my companions, when we came to the strait pass, where Hercules ordained the boundaries not to be o'erstepped by man. The walls of Seville to my right I left, on the other hand already Ceuta passed. O oh, brothers, I began, who to the west through perils without number now have reached, to this the short remaining watch, that yet our senses have to wake, refuse not proof of the unpeopled world, following the track of Phoebus. Call to mind from whence we sprang. Ye were not formed to live the life of brutes, but virtue to pursue and knowledge high. With these few words I sharpened for the voyage the mind of my associates, that I then could scarcely have withheld them. To the dawn our poop we turned, and for the witless flight made our oars wings, still gaining on the left. Each star of the other pole night now beheld, and ours so low that from the ocean floor it rose not, five times re-illumed, as oft vanished the light from underneath the moon since the deep way we entered, when from far appeared a mountain dim, loftiest methought of all I e'er beheld. Joy seized us straight, but soon to morning changed, from the new land a whirlwind sprung, and at her foremost side did strike the vessel. Thrice it whirled her round with all the waves, the fourth time lifted up the poop, and sank the prow, so fate decreed, and over us the booming billow closed. Canto 27 Now upward rose the flame, and stilled its light to speak no more, and now passed on with leave from the mild poet gained, when following came another, from whose top a sound confused, forth issuing, 
drew our eyes that way to look, as the Sicilian bull, that rightfully his cries first echoed, who had shaped its mold, did so rebello, with the voice of him tormented, that the brazen monster seemed pierced through with pain. Thus while no way they found nor avenue immediate through the flame, into its language turned the dismal words. But soon as they had won their passage forth, up from the point, which vibrating obeyed their motion at the tongue, these sounds we heard, O thou, to whom I now direct my voice, that lately didst exclaim in Lombard phrase, Depart thou, I solicit thee no more, though somewhat tardy I perchance arrive, let it not irk thee here to pause a while, and with me parley, lo, it irks not me, and yet I burn. If but e'en now thou fall into this blind world, from that pleasant land of Latium, whence I draw my sum of guilt, tell me if those who in Romagna dwell have peace or war. For of the mountains there was I, betwixt Urbino and the height, whence Tiber first unlocks his mighty flood. Leaning I listened yet with heedful ear, when, as he touched my side, the leader thus, Speak thou, he is a Latian. My reply was ready, and I spake without delay, O spirit, who art hidden here below. Never was thy Romagna without war in her proud tyrant's bosoms, nor is now, but open war there left I none. The state Ravenna hath maintained this many a year, is steadfast. There Polenta's eagle broods, and in his broad circumference of plume o'ershadows Servia. The green talons grasp the land that stood ere while the proof so long, and piled in bloody heap the host of France. The old mastiff of Verrucchio and the young, that tore Montagna in their wrath, still make, where they are wont, an augre of their fangs. Lamon's city and Santerno's range under the lion of the snowy lair. Inconstant partisan, that changeth sides, or ever summer yields to winter's frost. And she, whose flank is washed of Savio's wave, as twixt the level and the steep she lies, lives so twixt tyrant power and liberty. Now tell us, I entreat thee, who art thou? Be not more hard than others. In the world so may thy name still rear its forehead high. Then roared a while the fire, its sharpened point on either side waved, and thus breathed at last. If I did think, my answer were to one, whoever could return unto the world, this flame should rest unshaken. But since ne'er, if true be told me, any from this depth has found his upward way, I answer thee, nor fear lest infamy record the words. A man of arms at first I clothed me then in good St. Francis's girdle, hoping so to have made amends. And certainly my hope had failed not, but that he whom curses light on, the high priest again seduced me into sin. And how and wherefore listen while I tell. Long as this spirit moved the bones and pulp my mother gave me, less my deeds bespake the nature of the lion than the fox. All ways of winding subtlety I knew, and with such art conducted, that the sound reached the world's limit. Soon as to that part of life I found me come, when each behoves to lower sails and gather in the lines, that which before had pleased me then I rued, and to repentance and confession turned, wretch that I was, and well it had bested me. The chief of the new Pharisees, meantime, waging his warfare near the Lateran, not with the Saracens or Jews, his foes all Christians were, nor against Acre one had fought, nor trafficked in the Soldan's land. He his great charge, nor sacred ministry in himself, reverenced, nor in me that cord, which used to mark with leanness whom it girded. As in Socrates, Constantine besought to cure his leprosy Sylvester's aid, so me to cure the fever of his pride this man besought. My counsel to that end he asked, and I was silent for his words seemed drunken, but forthwith he thus resumed, From thy heart banish fear, of all offence I hitherto absolve thee. In return teach me my purpose so to execute, that Penestrino cumber earth no more. Heaven, as thou knowest, I have power to shut and open, and the keys are therefore twain, the which my predecessor meanly prized. Then yielding to the forceful arguments, of silence as more perilous I deemed, and answered, Father, since thou washest me clear of that guilt wherein I now must fall, large promise with performance scant, be sure, shall make thee triumph in thy lofty seat. When I was numbered with the dead, then came St. Francis for me. But a cherub dark he met who cried, Wrong me not, he is mine, and must below to join the wretched crew, for the deceitful counsel which he gave. Ere since I watched him hovering at his hair, no power can the impenitent absolve, nor to repent and will at once consist, by contradiction absolute forbid. 
O misery, how I shook myself when he seized me and cried, Thou haply thoughtst me not a disputant in logic so exact. To Minos down he bore me, and the judge twinned eight times round his callous back the tail, which biting with excess of rage he spake, This is a guilty soul, that in the fire must vanish. Hence perdition doomed I rove a prey to rankling sorrow in this garb. When he had thus fulfilled his words, the flame in dolor parted, beating to and fro, and writhing its sharp horn. We onward went, I and my leader, up along the rock, far as another arch that overhangs the fosse, wherein the penalty is paid of those who load them with committed sin. Canto 28 Who, e'en in words unfettered, might at full tell of the wounds and blood that now I saw, though he repeated off the tale. No tongue so vast a theme could equal, speech and thought both impotent alike. If in one band collected stood the people all, who e'er poured on Apulia's happy soil their blood, slain by the Trojans, and in that long war when of the rings the measured booty made a pile so high, as Rome's historian writes, who errs not with the multitude that felt the grinding force of Guiscard's Norman steel, and those the rest, whose bones are gathered yet at Seperano, there where treachery branded the Apulian name, or where beyond thy walls, O Tagliacozzo, without arms the old Alardo conquered, and his limbs, one were to show transpierced, another his clean lopped away. A spectacle like this were but a thing of naught to the hideous sight of the ninth chasm. A rundlet, that hath lost its middle or side stave, gapes not so wide as one I marked, torn from the chin throughout down to the hinder passage, twixt the legs dangling his entrails hung, the midriff lay open to view, and wretched ventricle, that turns the englutted aliment to dross. Whilst eagerly I fix on him my gaze, he eyed me, with his hands laid his breast bare, and cried, Now mark how I do rip me. Lo! How is Muhammad mangled? Before me walks Ali weeping from the chin his face cleft to the forelock, and the others all whom here thou seest while they lived, did so scandal and schism, and therefore thus are rent. A fiend is here behind, who with his sword hacks us thus cruelly, slivering again each of this ream, when we have compassed round the dismal way, for first our gashes close ere we repass before him. But say who art thou that standest musing on the rock, haply so lingering to delay the pain sentenced upon thy crimes? Him death not yet, my guide rejoined, hath overta'en, nor sin conducts to torment. But that he may make full trial of your state, I who am dead must through the depths of hell, from orb to orb, conduct him. Trust my words, for they are true. More than a hundred spirits, when that they heard, stood in the fosse to mark me through amazed, forgetful of their pangs. Thou who perchance shalt shortly view the sun, this warning thou bear to Dolcino. Bid him, if he wish not here soon to follow me, that with good store of food he arm him, lest imprisoning snows yield him a victim to Novara's power, no easy conquest else. With foot upraised for stepping spake Mohammed on the ground, then fixed it to depart. Another shade, pierced in the throat, his nostrils mutilate e'en from beneath the eyebrows, and one ear lopped off, who with the rest through wonder stood gazing before the rest advanced, and barred his windpipe, that without was all o'er smeared with crimson stain. O thou, said he, whom sin condemns not, and whom erst unless too near resemblance do deceive me, I aloft have seen on Latian ground, call thou to mind Piero of Medicina, if again returning, Thou behold'st the pleasant land that from Vercelli slopes to Mercabo, and there instruct the twain, whom Fano boasts her worthiest sons, Guido and Angelo, that if tis given us here to scan aright the future, they out of life's tenement shall be cast forth, and whelmed under the waves near to Catolica, through perfidy of a fell tyrant. Twixt the Cyprian Isle and Balearic, ne'er hath Neptune seen an injury so foul, by pirates done or Argive crew of old. That one-eyed traitor, whose realm there is a spirit here were fain his eye had still lacked sight of, them shall bring to conference with him, then so shape his end, that they shall need not gainst Fokara's wind offer up vow nor prayer. I answering thus, declare as thou dost wish that I above may carry tidings of thee, who is he, in whom that sight doth wake such sad remembrance. Forthwith he laid his hand on the cheekbone of one, his fellow spirit, and his jaws expanding cried, Lo, this is he I wot of, he speaks not for himself, 
the outcast this who overwhelmed the doubt in Caesar's mind, affirming that delay to men prepared was ever harmful. Oh, how terrified methought was Curio, from whose throat was cut the tongue, which spake that hardy word. Then one maimed of each hand, uplifted in the gloom the bleeding stumps, that they with gory spots sullied his face, and cried, Remember thee of Mosca too, I who, alas, exclaimed, The deed once done there is an end, that proved a seed of sorrow to the Tuscan race. I added, I and death to thine own tribe. Whence heaping woe on woe, he hurried off, as one grief stung to madness. But I there still lingered to behold the troop, and saw things, such as I may fear without more proof to tell of. But that conscience makes me firm, the boon companion, who her strong breastplate buckles on him, that feels no guilt within, and bids him on and fear not. Without doubt I saw, and yet it seems to pass before me, a headless trunk, that even as the rest of the sad flock paced onward. By the hair it bore the severed member, lantern-wise pendant in hand, which looked at us and said, Woe's me! The spirit lighted thus himself, and two there were in one, and one in two. How that may be he knows who ordereth so. When at the bridge's foot direct he stood, his arm aloft he reared, thrusting the head full in our view, that nearer we might hear the words which thus it uttered. Now behold this grievous torment thou who breathing goest to spy the dead. Behold, if any else be terrible as this, and that on earth thou mayst bear tidings of me, know that I am Bertrand, he of Bourne, who gave King John the council mischievous. Father and son I set at mutual war, for Absalom and David Moore did not Ahitophel, spurring them on maliciously to strife. For parting those so closely knit, my brain parted, alas, I carry from its source that in this trunk inhabits. Thus the law of retribution fiercely works in me. Canto 29 so were mine eyes inebriate with view of the vast multitude, whom various wounds disfigured, that they longed to stay and weep. But Virgil roused me. What yet gazest on? Wherefore doth fasten yet thy sight below among the maimed and miserable shades? Thou hast not shown in any chasm beside this weakness. No, if thou wouldst number them that two and twenty miles the valley winds its circuit, and already is the moon beneath our feet. The time permitted now is short and more not seen remains to see. If thou, I straight replied, hadst weighed the cause for which I looked, thou hadst perchance excused the tarrying still. My leader part pursued his way, the while I followed, answering him, and adding thus, Within that cave I deem, whereon so fixedly I held my ken, there is a spirit dwells, one of my blood, wailing the crime that costs him now so dear. Then spake my master, let thy soul no more afflict itself for him. Direct elsewhere its thought and leave him. At the bridge's foot I marked how he did point with menacing look at thee, and heard him by the others named Gary of Bello. Thou so holy then wert busied with his spirit, who once ruled the towers of Hotford, that thou lookedst not that way, ere he was gone. O guide beloved, his violent death yet unavenged, said I, by any who are partners in his shame, made him contemptuous. Therefore, as I think, he passed me speechless by, and doing so hath made me more compassionate his fate. So we discoursed to where the rock first showed the other valley, had more light been there, e'en to the lowest depth. Soon as we came o'er the last cloister in the dismal rounds of Malibolge, and the brotherhood were to our view exposed, then many a dart of sore lament assailed me, headed all with points of thrilling pity, that I closed both ears against the volley with mine hands. As were the torment, if each Lazar house of Valdiciana, in the sultry time twixt July and September, with the isle Sardinia and Maremma's pestilent fen, had heaped their maladies all in one foss together, such was here the torment, dire the stench, as issuing steams from festered limbs. We on the utmost shore of the long rock descended still to leftward. Then my sight was livelier to explore the depth, wherein the minister of the most mighty lord, all searching justice, dooms to punishment, the forgers noted on her dread record. More rueful was it not, methinks, to see the nation in Aegina droop, what time each living thing, e'en to the little worm, all fell, so full of malice was the air. And afterward, as bards of yore have told, the ancient people were restored anew from seed of emmets, then was here to see the spirits, that languished through the murky veil up piled on many a stack. 
Confused they lay, one o'er the belly, o'er the shoulders, one rolled of another. Sidling crawled a third along the dismal pathway. Step by step we journeyed on, in silence looking round, and listening those diseased, who strove in vain to lift their forms. Then two I marked, that sat propped against each other, as two brazen pans set to retain the heat. From head to foot, a tetter barked them round, nor saw I ere groom currying so fast, for whom his lord impatient waited, or himself perchance teared with long watching, as of these each one plied quickly his keen nails, through furiousness of ne'er abated pruriency. The crust came drawn from underneath in flakes, like scales scrapped from the bream or fish of broader mail. O thou who with thy fingers rendest off thy coat of proof, thus spake my guide to one, and sometimes makest tearing pincers of them. Tell me if any born of Latian land be among these within, so may thy nails serve thee for everlasting to this toil. Both are of Latium, weeping he replied, whom tortured thus thou seest, but who art thou that hast inquired of us? To whom my guide? One that descend with this man who yet lives, from rock to rock, and show him hell's abyss. Then started they asunder, and each turned trembling toward us, with the rest, whose ear those words redounding struck. To me my liege addressed him, Speak to them whate'er thou list. And I therewith began, So may no time filch your remembrance from the thoughts of men in the upper world, but after many sons survive it as ye tell me who ye are, and of what race ye come. Your punishment, unseemly and disgustful in its kind, deter you not from opening thus much to me. Arezzo was my dwelling, answered one, and me Albero of Siena brought to die by fire, but that for which I died leads me not here. True as in sport, I told him, that I had learned to wing my flight in air. And he admiring much as he was void of wisdom, willed me to declare to him the secret of mine art, and only hence, because I made him not a Daedalus, prevailed on one supposed his sire to burn me. But minus to this chasm last of the ten, for that I practiced alchemy on earth has doomed me, him no subterfuge eludes. Then to the bard I spake, Was ever race light as Siena's? Sure not France herself can show a tribe so frivolous and vain. The other leprous spirit heard my words and thus returned. Be stricker from this charge exempted, he who knew so temperately to lay out fortune's gifts, and Niccolo who first the spice's costly luxury discovered in that garden, where such seed roots deepest in the soil and be that troop exempted, with whom Caccia of Asiano lavished his vineyards and wide-spreading woods, and his rare wisdom of Agliato showed a spectacle for all, that thou mayest know who seconds thee against the sea and ease, thus gladly bend this way thy sharpened sight, that well my face may answer to thy ken, so shalt thou see I am Capocchio's ghost, who forged transmuted metals by the power of alchemy, and if I scan thee right, Thus needs must well remember how I aped creative nature by my subtle art. Canto 30 What time resentment burned in Juno's breast for Semele against the Theban blood, as more than once in dire mischance was rude, such fatal frenzy seized on Athamas, that he his spouse beholding with a babe laden on either arm, Spread out, he cried, the meshes that I take the lioness and the young lions at the pass. Then forth stretched he his merciless talons, grasping one, one helpless innocent Lurcus named, whom swinging down he dashed upon a rock, and with her other burden self-destroyed the hapless mother plunged, and when the pride of all presuming Troy fell from its height, by fortune overwhelmed and the old king with his realm perished, then did Hecuba, a wretch forlorn and captive, when she saw Polyxena first slaughtered, and her son, her Polydorus, on the wild sea-beach, next met the mourner's view, then reft of sense did she run barking even as a dog, such mighty power had grief to wrench her soul. Bet ne'er the Furies or of Thebes or Troy, with such fell cruelty were seen, their goads in fixing in the limbs of man or beast, as now too pale and naked ghost I saw that gnarling wildly scampered, like the swine excluded from his sty. One reached Capocchio, and in the neck joint sticking deep his fangs dragged him, that o'er the solid pavement rubbed his belly stretched out prone. The other shape, he of Arezzo, there left trembling, spake. That sprite of air is Shichi, in like mood of random mischief vents he still his spite. To whom I answering, O oh, as thou dost hope, 
the other may not flesh its jaws on thee. Be patient to inform us who it is, ere its speed hence. That is the ancient soul of wretched Mira, he replied, who burned with most unholy flame for her own sire, and a false shape assuming so performed the deed of sin. E'en as the other there that onward passes darred to counterfeit Donati's features, to feign testament the seal affixing, that himself might gain, for his own share the lady of the herd. When vanished the two furious shades on whom mine eye was held, I turned it back to view the other cursed spirits. One I saw in fashion like a lute, had but the groin been severed, where it meets the forked part, swollen dropsy, disproportioning the limbs with ill-converted moisture, that the paunch suits not the visage, opened wide his lips, gasping as in the hectic man for drought, one towards the chin, the other upward curled. O ye, who in this world of misery wherefore I know not are exempt from pain, thus he began, attentively regard Adamo's woe, when living full supply ne'er lacked me of what most I coveted, one drop of water now, alas, I crave. The rills that glitter down the grassy slopes of Casentino, making fresh and soft the banks whereby they glide to Arno's stream, stand ever in my view, and not in vain. For more the pictured semblance dries me up, much more than the disease which makes the flesh desert these shriveled cheeks. So from the place where I transgressed, stern justice urging me, takes means to quicken more my laboring sighs. There is Romina, where I falsified the metal with the Baptist's form impressed, for which on earth I left my body burnt. But if I here might see the sorrowing soul of Guido, Alessandro, or their brother, for Branda's limpid spring I would not change the welcome sight. One is e'en now within, if truly the mad spirits tell that round are wandering. But wherein besteads me that? My limbs are fettered. Were I but so light, that I each hundred years might move one inch, I had set forth already on this path, seeking him out amidst the shapeless crew, although eleven miles it wind, not more than half of one across. They brought me down among this tribe, induced by them I stamped the florins with three carats of alloy. Who are that abject pair, I next inquired, that closely bounding thee upon thy right lie smoking, like a band in winter steeped in the chill stream? When to this gulf I dropped, he answered, here I found them. Since that hour they have not turned, nor ever shall I ween, till time hath run his course. One is that dame the false accuser of the Hebrew youth, Sinon the other, that false Greek from Troy. Sharp fever drains the reeky moistness out, in such a cloud upsteamed. When that he heard, one galled perchance to be so darkly named, with clenched hands smote him on the braced paunch, that like a drum resounded. But forthwith Adamo smote him on the face, the blow returning with his arm, that seemed as hard. Though my o'er-weighty limbs have ta'en from me the power to move, said he, I have an arm at liberty for such employ. To whom was answered, When thou wentest to the fire, thou hadst it not so ready at command, then readier when it coined the impostor gold. And thus the dropsied, I now speak'st thou true, but there thou gavest not such true testimony, when thou wast questioned of the truth at Troy. If I spake false, thou falsely stamp'st the coin, said Sinon. I am here but for one fault, and thou for more than any imp beside. Remember, he replied, O perjured one, the horse remember, that did teem with death, and all the world be witness to thy guilt. To thine, returned the Greek, witness the thirst whence thy tongue cracks, witness the fluid mound, reared by thy belly up before thine eyes, a mass corrupt to whom the coiner thus. Thy mouth gapes wide as ever to let pass its evil saying, Me of thirst assails, yet I am stuffed with moisture. Thou art parched, pains rack thy head. No urging wouldst thou need to make thee lap Narcissus's mirror up. I was all fixed to listen when my guide admonished, Now beware, a little more, and I do quarrel with thee. I perceived how angrily he spake, and towards him turned with shame so poignant, as remembered yet confounds me. As a man that dreams of harm befallen him, dreaming wishes it a dream, and that which is, desires as if it were not, such then was I who wanting power to speak wished to excuse myself, and all the while excused me, though unweeting that I did. More grievous fault than thine has been, less shame, my master cried, might expiate, therefore cast all sorrow from thy soul, 
and if again chance bring thee, where like conference is held, think I am ever at thy side, to hear such wrangling is a joy for vulgar minds. Canto 31 The very tongue whose keen reproof before had wounded me, that either cheek was stained, now ministered my cure. So have I heard Achilles and his father's javelin caused pain first, and then the boon of health restored. Turning our back upon the veil of woe, W. crossed the encircled mound in silence. There was twilight dim, that far long the gloom mine eye advanced not, but I heard a horn sounded aloud. The peal it blew had made the thunder feeble. Following its course the adverse way, my strained eyes were bent on that one spot. So terrible a blast Orlando blew not, when that dismal rout o'erthrew the host of Charlemagne and quenched his saintly warfare. Thitherward not long my head was raised, when many lofty towers methought I spied. Master, said I, what land is this? He answered straight, Too long a space of intervening darkness has thine eye to traverse. Thou hast therefore widely erred in thy imagining. Thither arrived thou well shalt see how distance can delude the sense. A little therefore urge thee on. Then tenderly he caught me by the hand. Yet no, said he, ere farther we advance, that it less strange may seem, these are not towers, but giants. In the pit they stand immersed, each from his navel downward, round the bank. As when a fog disperseth gradually, our vision traces what the mist involves condensed in air, so piercing through the gross and gloomy atmosphere, as more and more we neared toward the brink, mine error fled, and fear came o'er me. As with circling round of turrets Monteregian crowns his walls, e'en thus the shore encompassing the abyss was turreted with giants, half their length uprearing horrible, whom Jove from heaven yet threatens when his muttering thunder rolls. Of one already I descried the face, shoulders, and breast, and of the belly huge great part, and both arms down along his ribs. All teeming nature, when her plastic hand left framing of these monsters, did display past doubt her wisdom, taking from mad war such slaves to do his bidding. And if she repent her not of the elephant and whale, who ponders well confesses her therein wiser and more discreet, for when brute force and evil will are backed with subtlety, resistance none avails. His visage seemed in length and bulk as doth the pine that tops St. Peter's Roman fane, and the other bones of like proportion, so that from above the bank which girdled him below, such height arose his stature, that three Frieslanders had striven in vain to reach but to his hair. Full thirty ample palms was he exposed downward from whence a man his garments loops. Raphael by Ameth Sabi Almi, so shouted his fierce lips, which sweeter hymns became not, and my guide addressed him thus. O senseless spirit, let thy horn for thee interpret, therewith vent thy rage, if rage or other passion ring thee. Search thy neck, there shalt thou find the belt that binds it on. Wild spirit, lo, upon thy mighty breast where hangs the baldric. Then to me he spake, he doth accuse himself. Nimrod is this, through whose ill counsel in the world no more one tongue prevails. But pass we on, nor waste our words, for so each language is to him, as his to others, understood by none. Then to the leftward turning sped we forth, and at a sling's throw found another shade far fiercer and more huge. I cannot say what master hand had girt him, but he held behind the right arm fettered, and before the other with a chain that fastened him from the neck down, and five times round his form apparent met the wreathed links. This proud one would of his strength against almighty Jove make trial, said my guide, whence he is thus requited. Ephialtes him they call. Great was his prowess, when the giants brought fear on the gods, those arms which then he piled, now moves he never. Forthwith I returned. Fain would I, if twere possible, mine eyes of Briareus immeasurable gained experience next. He answered, Thou shalt see not far from hence Antius, who both speaks and is unfettered, who shall place us there where guilt is at its depth. Far onward stands whom thou wouldst fain behold in chains, and made like to this spirit, save that in his looks more fell he seems. By violent earthquake rocked ne'er shook a tower so reeling to its base, as Ephialtes. More than ever then I dreaded death, nor than the terror more had needed, if I had not seen the cords that held him fast. We, straightway journeying on, came to Antius, who five ells complete without the head, forth issued from the cave. O thou who in the fortunate vale, 
that made great Scipio heir of glory, when his sword drove back the troop of Hannibal in flight, who thence of old didst carry for thy spoil an hundred lions. And if thou hadst fought in the high conflict on thy brethren's side, seems as men yet believed, that through thine arm the sons of earth had conquered, now vouchsafe to place us down beneath, where numbing cold locks up Cositus. Force not that we crave or Titius's help or Typhon's. Here is one can give what in this realm ye covet. Stoop therefore, nor scornfully distort thy lip. He in the upper world can yet bestow renown on thee, for he doth live, and looks for life yet longer, if before the time grace call him not unto herself. Thus spake the teacher. He in haste forth stretched his hands and caught my guide. Alcides Wylam felt that grapple straightened score. Soon as my guide had felt it, he bespake me thus. This way that I may clasp thee, then so caught me up, that we were both one burden. As appears the tower of Caricenda, from beneath where it doth lean, if chance a passing cloud so sail across, that opposite it hangs, such then Antius seemed, as at mine ease I marked him stooping. I were fain at times to have passed another way. Yet in the abyss, that Lucifer with Judas low engulfs, lightly he placed us, nor their leaning stayed, but rose as in a bark the stately mast. Canto 32 Could I command rough rhymes and horse to suit that hole of sorrow, o'er which every rock his firm abutment rears, then might the vein of fancy rise full springing, but not mine. Such measures and with faltering awe I touch the mighty theme, for to describe the depth of all the universe is no emprise to jest with and demands a tongue not used to infant babbling. But let them assist my song, the tuneful maidens, by whose aid Amphion walled in Thebes, so with the truth my speech shall best accord. O ill-starred folk beyond all others wretched, who abide in such a mansion as scarce thought finds words to speak of, better had ye here on earth been flocks or mountain goats, as down we stood in the dark pit beneath the giant's feet, but lower far than they and I did gaze still on the lofty battlement, a voice bespoke me thus, Look how thou walkest, take good heed, thy souls do tread not on the heads of thy poor brethren. Thereupon I turned, and saw before and underneath my feet a lake, whose frozen surface liker seemed to glass than water. Not so thick a veil in winter air hath Austrian Danube spread o'er his still course, nor Tanaeus far remote under the chilling sky. Rolled o'er that mass had Tabernick or Pietrapana fallen, not e'en its rim had creaked. As peeps the frog croaking above the wave, what time in dreams the village gleaner oft pursues her toil, so to where modest shame appears, thus low, blue, pinched, and shrined in ice the spirit stood, moving their teeth in shrill note like the stork. His face each downward held, their mouth the cold, their eyes expressed the dolor of their heart. A space I looked around, then at my feet saw two so strictly joined, that of their head the very hairs were mingled. Tell me ye, whose bosoms thus together press, said I, who are ye? At that sound their necks they bent, and when their looks were lifted up to me, straightway their eyes, before all moist within, distilled upon their lips, and the frost bound the tears betwixt those orbs and held them there. Plank unto plank hath never cramp closed up so stoutly. Whence like two enraged goats they clashed together, them such fury seized, and one from whom the cold both ears had reft exclaimed, still looking downward, Why on us dost speculate so long? If thou wouldst know who are these two, the valley, whence his wave Bicenzio slopes, did for its master own their sire Alberto, and next him themselves. They from one body issued, and throughout Cana thou mayst search, nor find a shade more worthy in congealment to be fixed, not him, whose breast and shadow Arthur's land. At that one blow dissevered, not Focaccia, no, not this spirit, whose o'er-jutting head obstructs my onward view. He bore the name of Mascheroni. Tuscan, if thou be, well knowest who he was. And to cut short all further question, in my form behold what once was Comicione. I await Carlino here my kinsman, whose deep guilt shall wash out mine. A thousand visages then marked I which the keen and eager cold had shaped into a doggish grin, whence creeps a shivering horror o'er me at the thought of those frore shallows. While we journeyed on toward the middle, at whose point unites all heavy substance, and I trembling went through that eternal chillness, I know not, if will it were, or destiny, or chance,
but passing midst the heads, my foot did strike with violent blow against the face of one. Wherefore dost bruise me? Weeping, he exclaimed, unless thy errand be some fresh revenge for Monteperto, wherefore troublest me? I thus, instructor, now await me here, that I through him may rid me of my doubt. Thenceforth what haste thou wilt. The teacher paused, and to that shade I spake, who bitterly still cursed me in his wrath. What art thou, speak, that railest thus on others? He replied, Now who art thou that smiting others' cheeks through Antinora Romest, with such force as were past sufferance, wert thou living still? And I am living to thy joy perchance, was my reply, if fame be dear to thee, that with the rest I may thy name enroll. The contrary of what I covet most, said he, thou tenderest, hence, nor vex me more. Ill knowest thou to flatter in this vale. Then seizing on his hinder scalp, I cried, Name thee, or not a hair shall tarry here. Rend all away, he answered, yet for that I will not tell nor show thee who I am, though at my head thou pluck a thousand times. O thou who show so beastly sign of hate gainst him thou prayst on, let me hear, said I, the cause on such condition, that if right warrant thy grievance, knowing who ye are, and what the color of his sinning was, I may repay thee in the world above if that wherewith I speak be moist so long. Canto 33 His jaws uplifting from their fell repast, that sinner wiped them on the hairs of the head, which he behind had mangled, then began, Thy will obeying I call up a fresh sorrow past cure, which but to think of rings my heart, or e'er I tell on't. But if words that I may utter shall prove seed to bear fruit of eternal infamy to him, the traitor whom I gnaw at, Thou at once shalt see me speak and weep. Who thou mayest be I know not, nor how here below art come. But Florentine thou seemest of a truth, when I do hear thee. Know I was on earth Count Ugolino, and the Archbishop E. Ruggieri. Why I neighbor him so close now list, that through effect of his ill thoughts in him my trust reposing I was ta'en, and after murdered need is not I tell. What therefore thou canst not have heard, that is, how cruel was the murder shalt thou hear and know if he have wronged me. A small grate within that mew, which for my sake the name of famine bears, where others yet must pine, already through its opening several moons had shown me, when I slept the evil sleep, that from the future tore the curtain off. This one, methought, as master of the sport, rode forth to chase the gaunt wolf and his whelps unto the mountain, which forbids the sight of Luca to the Pisan. With lean brocks inquisitive and keen, before him rang Lanfranchi with Sismondi and Gualandi. After short course the father and the sons seemed tired and lagging, and methought I saw the sharp tusks gore their sides. When I awoke before the dawn amid their sleep I heard my sons, for they were with me, weep and ask for bread. Right cruel art thou, if no pang thou feel at thinking what my heart foretold, and if not now, why use thy tears to flow? Now had they wakened and the hour drew near when they were wont to bring us food. The mind of each misgave him through his dream, and I heard at its outlet underneath locked up the horrible tower, whence uttering not a word I looked upon the visage of my sons. I wept not, so all stone I felt within, they wept, and one my little Anselm cried, Thou lookest so, father what ails thee? Yet I shed no tear, nor answered all that day nor the next night, until another sun came out upon the world. When a faint beam had to our doleful prison made its way, and in four countenances I descried the image of my own, on either hand through agony I bit, and they who thought I did it through desire of feeding, rose of the sudden and cried, Father, we should grieve far less, if thou wouldst eat of us. Thou gavest these weeds of miserable flesh we wear, and do thou strip them off from us again. Then, not to make them sadder, I kept down my spirit in stillness. That day and the next we all were silent. Ah, obdurate earth, why opens not upon us? When we came to the fourth day, then Ghetto at my feet outstretched did fling him, crying, Hast no help for me, my father. There he died, and e'en plainly as thou seest me, saw I the three fall one by one twixt the fifth day and sixth. Whence I betook me now grown blind to grope over them all, and for three days aloud called on them who were dead, then fasting got the mastery of grief. Thus having spoke, once more upon the wretched skull his teeth he fastened, 
like a mastiff's against the bone, firm and unyielding. O thou Pisa, shame of all the people who their dwelling make in that fair region, where the Italian voice is heard, since that thy neighbors are so slack to punish. From their deep foundations rise Capria and Gorgona, and dam up the mouth of Arno, that each soul in thee may perish in the waters. What if fame reported that thy castles were betrayed by Ugolino, yet no right hadst thou to stretch his children on the rack? For them, Brigata, Ugaccione, and the pair of gentle ones, of whom my song hath told, their tender years, thou modern Thebes, did make uncapable of guilt. Onward we passed, where others scarfed in rugged folds of ice, not on their feet were turned, but each reversed. Their very weeping suffers not to weep, for at their eyes grief-seeking passage finds impediment, and rolling inward turns for increase of sharp anguish. The first tears hang clustered, and like crystal visors show, under the socket brimming all the cup. Now though the cold had from my face dislodged each feeling, as t'were callous, yet me seemed some breath of wind I felt. Whence cometh this, said I, my master, is not here below all vapour quenched? Thou shalt be speedily, he answered, where thine eye shall tell thee whence the cause descrying of this airy shower. Then cried out one in the chill crust who mourned, O souls so cruel, that the farthest post hath been assigned you, from this face remove the hardened veil, that I may vent the grief impregnate at my heart, some little space ere it congeal again. I thus replied, Say who thou wast if thou wouldst have mine aid, and if I extricate thee not, far down as to the lowest ice may I descend. The friar Alberigo, answered he, am I who from the evil garden plucked its fruitage, and am here repaid, the date more luscious for my fig. Ha! I exclaimed, art thou too dead? How in the world aloft it fareth with my body, answered he, I am right ignorant. Such privilege hath Ptolemea, that oft times the soul drops hither ere by Atropos divorced, and that thou mayest wipe out more willingly the glazed teardrops that o'erlay mine eyes. Know that the soul that moment she betrays, as I did, yields her body to a fiend, who after moves and governs it at will, till all its time be rounded, headlong she falls to this cistern. And perchance above doth yet appear the body of a ghost, who here behind me winters. Him thou knowest, if thou but newly art arrived below. The years are many that have passed away, since to this fastness Branca Doria came. Now, answered I, methinks thou mockest me, for Branca Doria never yet hath died, but doth all natural functions of a man, eats, drinks, and sleeps, and putteth raiment on. He thus, not yet unto that upper fosse by the evil talons guarded, where the pitch tenacious boils, had Michael Zanke reached, when this one left a demon in his stead in his own body, and of one his kin, who with him treachery wrought. But now put forth thy hand and ope mine eyes. I oped them not. Ill manners were best courtesy to him. Ah, Genoese, men perverse in every way, with every foulness stained, why from the earth are ye not cancelled? Such an one of yours I with Romagna's darkest spirit found, as for his doings even now in soul is in Cositus plunged, and yet doth seem in body still alive upon the earth. Canto 34 the banners of hell's monarch do come forth towards us. Therefore look, so spake my guide, if thou discern him. As when breathes a cloud heavy and dense, or when the shades of night fall on our hemisphere, seems viewed from far a windmill, which the blast stirs briskly round. Such was the fabric then methought I saw, to shield me from the wind. Forthwith I drew behind my guide. No covert else was there. Now came I, and with fear I bid my strain record the marvel where the souls were all whelmed underneath, transparent, as through glass pellucid the frail stem. Some prone were laid, others stood upright, this upon the souls, that on his head, a third with face to feet arched like a bow. When to the point we came, whereat my guide was pleased that I should see the creature eminent in beauty once, he from before me stepped and made me pause. Lo, he exclaimed, lo dis, and lo the place where thou hast need to arm thy heart with strength. How frozen and how faint I then became, ask me not, reader, for I write it not, since words would fail to tell thee of my state. I was not dead nor living. Think thyself, if quick conception work in thee at all, how I did feel. That emperor who sways the realm of sorrow, at mid-breast from the ice stood forth, 
and I in stature am more like a giant than the giants are in his arms. Mark now how great that hole must be, which suits with such a part. If he were beautiful as he is hideous now, and yet did dare to scowl upon his maker, well from him may all our misery flow. Oh, what a sight! How passing strange it seemed when I did spy upon his head three faces, one in front of Hugh Vermilion, the other two with this midway each shoulder joined and at the crest, the right twixt wan and yellow seemed, the left to look on, such as come from whence old Nile stoops to the lowlands. Under each shot forth two mighty wings, enormous as became a bird so vast. Sails never such I saw outstretched on the wide sea. No plumes had they, but were in texture like a bat, and these he flapped in the air, that from him issued still three winds, wherewith Cositus to its depth was frozen. At six eyes he wept, the tears adown three chins distilled with bloody foam. At every mouth his teeth a sinner champed bruised as with ponderous engine, so that three were in this guise tormented. But far more than from that gnawing was the foremost panged by the fierce rending, whence oft times the back was stripped of all its skin. That upper spirit, who hath worse punishment, so spake my guide, is Judas, he that hath his head within and plies the feet without. Of the other two whose heads are under from the murky jaw who hangs is Brutus. Lo, how he doth writhe and speaks not, the other Cassius that appears so large of limb, but night now reascends, and it is time for parting, all is seen.